Thank you. Well, I want to thank the two of you. Thank you, Irma, for the questions and the drill man too. Now I invite you to, uh, to have an eight minute break and we'll meet again at 15.05 UTC to start with the DNS DNS sec tutorial. See you later.
Bienvenidos nuevamente. Es un honor para Welcome again. It's an honor for us to have you here for the next tutorial on DNS DNSSEC. In the previous uh, uh, session, we had uh, Carlos Martinez, the manager of the technical area of LACNIC. He will be the instructor, the trainer in this tutorial. And we also have a trainer, Nicolas Antoniello, regional manager of technical participation of ICANN. The idea is to give you some hands-on experience on some concepts of DNS and DNSSEC. It will, they will give you an overview of how to um, uh, configure, set up uh, the servers, both the recursive and authoritative and explain some uh, um, tips on uh, troubleshooting and monitoring. We want you to use the Q&A panel for questions and we'll also answer your questions uh, uh, with the mic. You know that uh, you have to raise your hands for that. And uh, the trainers will give you the floor. There you have to say your name, that of your organization. And after you complete your question, you uh, put your hand down. So Nicolas and Carlos, you have the floor. No, sorry, I didn't find uh, the window, the Zoom window. Are you there, Nico? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me well? Yes. Well, we all do those things. Uh -huh. How are you, Nico? It seems uh, as if it, we were October last year, we're doing the same. Yes, we continue to do this. The pandemic has been long. Well, welcome you all. I'm Carlos again. And the idea, well, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for the, uh, your interest on uh, the DNS, DNS tech tutorial. Well, we won't do exactly the same as October last year because we did something that was just one way. We gave you a demo that I think was very good. <clears throat> and we talked a lot. The idea here is not to talk so much and do more things. As a matter of fact, I marveled with a lab that Nico put on uh, uh, put together in uh, online. I think it's a wonderful tool, but we will have to talk a bit. And that is what I'm going to start by doing. And then I'm going to give the floor to Nicolas. I'll have to open Chrome again, sorry. Well, that's what you have to pay for, for switching from one presentation to the other. There we are. And now let's share. Now, and let me well, let me start while you fix that. I want to tell you all that as as always, any question you have, you may write it down in the Q and A panel. Try not to write in the chat because we we are not checking that. So if you have any comment or any questions, if you want it to be read here, put in the Q&A panel, please. Well, I think that in, the, well, in this part of the presentation, I don't think that uh, the microphone is enabled, but in the second part where that's going to be the laboratory hands-on, you will be able to raise your hand and uh, to um we'll open the the microphone yes that's right we're going to enable the microphone please follow the same protocol as in um uh we did so far and we're going to do the same as in the forum just 30 seconds because if not it's it's uh, difficult to pay attention to everyone so let me start what are we doing what will we do today basically we are going to review some concepts much more briefly than we did in October. The October presentation is uh, posted, so you can have access to it and you can go through it again. What we're going to review is what DNS is, uh, what's its uh, a role, the semantic structure of the DNS, that sometimes is misunderstood, and the relevant reference servers, the client, recursive, authoritative, and uh, we're going to see some examples of queries. And then I'm going to very gladly give you the floor to 
uh, Nico, uh, because he's going to tell you about DNSSEC and the, the digital signatures and uh, the uh, uh, rest. So the DNS, the most big, is in the end a directory uh, as, as the telephone uh, directory. Basically, it's a database where it's very easy to look for an address, but not in the other. That is, you, you may know the person's name, you may know the telephone, but not the other way around. If you have the telephone number, it's difficult to find who it is. So the DNS is a directory uh, service. So what is the equivalent of the person? Something that uh, we, um, and plus another a uh, parameter that is called type. And you may, somebody may tell me you, you are forgetting uh, the class, but it's 99% uh, of uh, the queries you don't need it. So, but there is a third par parameter that is uh, uh, constant, so we don't include it. So this directory, I, I put in a name and a type and I'll obtain a, a, a value. What is the name? Um, it's, it's a string. It's a string with a certain structure. These are character uh, tags separated by a dot, which may or may not mean something. It may be part of the string, which may have the uh, meaning of the delegation. Um, so this shows that uh, the delegation may exist and the value will depend on the type. So here comes the semantic structure. The different types have different semantics different meanings. So when we speak of types, it will be implicit. Um, it's quite, uh, it, it's like when, it, when you know that um, you can't put any floating uh, uh, points or In the types of uh, registries, there's more than 100. But actually, 99% of the uses um, is related to these. The SOA, the A registry, 4A, uh, MX, NS, TXT, and C name. What is the semantic of those uh, uh, registers? Uh, SOA gives a structure to the DNS and it says this is a zone, this is a structure, a page of a, uh, administrative of authority, and it defines some parameters of the timing, the time so where the protocol goes on, and this is the most important thing. The A registry represents IPv4 addresses for A, IPv6, and MX represents or indicates the mail server for a, for a certain, for instance, if you look up MX, it, 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 what, you have to see who, where I have to send uh, the mails to Carlos at LACNIC. And the NS registry is what we use to delegate. That is when there's the, a dot, and we delegate to another server, then we'll use an NS. The TXT is a text registry, a string, and that is not, was not too interesting until we started see, seeing some uses. The C name is a registry that today with a, uh, is, it's a registry that uh, has been, one, has become one of the most used uh, in addition to A and quadruple A. So when you have, when I said uh, name, type, and it gives me a value, I'm going to use this in taxes to present, um, well, I, if you look at the type of query, um, in the next of the slides, I'm going to show it with these brackets. So I ask the DNS for the name, uh, type, uh, uh, a, a www.lacnic.net and it will give me an IPv4 address. And the DNS 
doesn't know whether that's the address of a web server. It's just one more entry in a directory. The type uh, being www is a convention. It could be called anything. And as a matter of fact, instead of www, you could uh, host things that are not web. So one thing doesn't have to do with the other. Just as in the telephone number, you may have uh, 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 pizza, uh, heart, uh, or it could be my aunt's house. In the second example, there's a search in, uh, if you put MX, uh, the, then you have this registry, items.org. And here, different from the other one, it, this gives me back a string, another name. So if I want to send a mail to uh, the, uh, the address icon.org, I have to make the two queries because I'm going to ask for MX and I have to ask again to get the address. So, the, so um, the correspondence uh, can be from one to many. That is, that a query for a name and or a type get, can give me more than one registry. It's the case of whois.lacnic.net, and it's a, the same as uh, a max uh, with icon.org. So this is the version for which it is very difficult to invert the DNS query because usually it's not one to one. It's not even well defined. So it's more a matter of how the directory is ordered. So what happens when there is more than one? Well, in general, you assume that when there is more than one, that is done to give a certain degree of high availability to a service and a, a client that behaves himself. And, uh, it could be a browser or who is client or whatever should take that result and try with that. Because, and if that works, uh, if, uh, if it doesn't work, try the second or then try the third, but not all clients behave themselves. So not necessarily is this the perfect way of doing things and it's quite useful and it's more used. The tree of the DNS. <clears throat> Well, you know that uh, the names, uh, the, that the DNS is structured as a tree. And I go back to this um, example, www.lacnic.net.oi, because there's always a DNS uh, tree, uh, a, a, a labeled uh, tree, this red dot. I don't always put it until I find situations where if I don't put it, everything uh, goes uh, wrong. We're going to see that in the hands-on, but the net, but the root is always there. And why is the root key? Because it's the only thing, it's the only name within a DNS that all the servers in the world know that they exist. And so it's there that we start uh, finding things in uh, the directory. So the analogy of the telephone book, I always know that there's an A, there's the first page, uh, that's where I start looking for. Siri is talking to me. So this starts with the root, and so we, this is what we call the root servers. <clears throat> so you notice that they play a key role. So the root only has delegations and the first level and this here, the UI is the what we call the DLDs or the, uh, the top level dom domains. You know that they exist in at least three flavors, the country code, EUI, BR, etc. The generic, org, dot org, dot net, etc. And the new TLDs or new GTLDs that are these new tags such as dot training that we're going to use today. Uh, one of these uh, days I'm going to buy the Carlos.ninja and some other tags. Um, there, there's a whole range of possibilities and curiously in, enough, some people are still surprised to discover the existence of some. So as we go down, 
third or four level, there is nothing written about whether to have a two level domain or a three level domain or four or five. Obviously, it's the most cumbersome, but sometimes there are uses. As a matter of fact, at LACNIC, we have some fourth level uh, domains that we use in a production. Please don't be frightened with the delegation, but don't abuse because it makes the tree dense and the same level is bad or doing it too deep may also be bad. We are introduce a friend who will be accompanying us for the rest of the presentation. This is Panda. And this is the first role of a DNS server, which is the role of the authoritative server. The authoritative server, and I always find it difficult to describe this, but the best quote is the authoritative is the owner of the truth. They have the authority to respond for something. So in this context of being the owner of the truth, the ultimate reference, it's like when I go and ask something from someone who knows something and they suspect what the answer is. And he said, well, you'd better ask this or the other person, you know, like with the doctors, I go to the general doctor and he says, no, better go and consult the dermatologist. So some specialists are authoritative for skin uh, issues. And in this case, or in this scheme, the blue server on the right is a server and the panda asks him, NS2, can you tell me what is a Ford A register of LACNIC.net? So this dialogue occurs through TCP or UTT through port 53. Remember port 53, TCP, UTP, port 20. The DNS responses have certain statuses. These are like the conditions, uh, the error conditions. So no error is when the query is successful. This does not mean that the responses are correct. It means that there was no error. There are other types of status, and I'll explain these later. And the mobile phone answers, I have this in my here, and the owner of the truth has stored the zone files in more sophisticated databases. But the idea is that the majority of the scenarios, you can go to the hard disk and you have a text file containing the zone with the truth about that zone. And let me tell you, well, it's more complicated as a result of the new internet. So most are IPv6, unless it is meaningful to have them an IPv4. Now look at the subtle difference between this question and the other question. The server is the same, the panda is the same, but here the question is different. NS2, could you tell me who is, or what is the value of the register quad A of www.google.com? And here, what happens here? The NS2 server not only does not know, but is not allowed to reply. And this is what then allows us to introduce the error error of the servers, which is a recursive one. The recursive servers, the authoritative cannot answer because they're not allowed to do recursiveness. This is a basic concept, and this is the case and was a reason for many headaches. This of leaving open recursive so that anyone can use it because it uses as vectors for attacks. So the status in this case is refused. Basically, the server is saying, I cannot answer, I'm not allowed to do so. And that is it. Now, what happens here? How do I discover this? Because at some time, in fact, the panda needs to have access to things that the authoritatives, or he doesn't know what the authoritatives are. So here, what we have is a recursion process. Remember what I'm saying that the root is a server that everyone knows or the zone that everyone knows and where it is located. Well, here, everything starts with asking the root. Root, tell me, where is a quad A of WW like Nick? And the root does not know, but tells us where net is. Net, I'm going to ask the same question. Tell me, where is a quad A of www.lacnic.net? And Net does not know, but it tells me where this one is here, the where LACNIC is, LACNIC.net is. And then ask again, what is www.lacnic.net? 
And here have the example of this command that allows you to obtain this answer. And in this next slide, let's see if this works. You will tell me. I have a video that lasts one minute exactly, 59 seconds, and you will see this process. There it is. I asked the root. And the root replies a lot of servers. I just select one, J, G. G is authoritative center for .NET. .NET. I asked this one. What do I ask? Exactly the same question that I had asked the root. Quad A. And these switches are so that the answer is cleaner. And it tells me which are the authorities of LACNIC.net. And here, I select just any. I could have selected one with more imagination, but anyway, I included this one. And I ask this one. And this is a response. Now, what happened here? I did recurse, the recursion by hand. I opened the terminal and I did, this, did these commands manually doing the same as a recursive server would do. So following this, we saw which is a process that is followed. Now, fortunately enough, we don't have to do it like that. Fortunately, we have the recursive servers, which are the ones that solve this. And I'm going to include many, many things together. When a user wishes to visit a website, the client asks the recursive his recursive server that does have the authorization to respond, but the one that does have the authorization to respond, it's going to ask that question because the triple W wishes to know. They're going to do the recursion like I did manually, and finally it will return the result to the user and the user will then connect. The TTL is another DNS parameter, it's time to live. And to make this more agile, the recursive servers store what they learn as they went along with the queries. The previous example, when I asked for .NET, the server that answered said, well, I did that and I stored it. So when I get another query about write.net, I know where .NET is. I don't have to ask the same question again. And that's why things are more agile. So the DNS always has the impression of being something that is very fast, but you will see that it does have a lot of work behind. So let me close here. And what do we have to remember here? How do we ask the DNS? We enter a name and a type and we obtain a value. Remember the structure of the inverted tree. We all have something in common, and the root is what allows us, it provides us this common nexus that we need to find this. And a DNS server can be recursive and or authoritative. Authoritative is the owner of the tree, and the recursive one is one that provides the clients with the service, assisting them to find the truth and identifying the authoritative one. So Nico, you now have the screen so I can have a micro break now. I stop sharing my screen so you can have your own. Like you were saying, any comments that you wish to make during my presentation, please feel free to do so. And also the participants, if you have any questions or comments, please include these in the Q&A section. And as these go along, and after that, towards the end, we can answer these questions. And if there are any questions that we have to highlight when you ask these at Carlos, can let me know and we can try and answer the question as I go along. So I will try to share my screen now. I was going to try something that Carlos taught me so that the image appears underneath, but I will not do things that I didn't test before. So let us now select this here. All right. So can you see my presentation? Please confirm. Carlos or anyone? Yes, Nico, we can see your screen. So let us start. The idea is, like Carlo was saying, to speak about DNSSEC and what 
DNS Sec adds to DNS. What it, we're going to try and explain this before starting. Let's explain this in a simple way. And presentations are always a challenge when we speak about DNS, because sometimes we have the impression that we explain things, but we don't explain these correctly. So hopefully this can be understood and try to make it as simple and friendly as possible. So please include questions and comments, because the point of all this is to make it interactive so that you don't get bored. So DNS protocol, as Carlos explained, has like two big parts or sections for communication. One is between the client's device and the recursive server. That's the one in charge of finding the response through me. And once it obtains the answer, it will return it. So that's segment of communication between the client and the client's device and the recursive server. And the second one, the second section for communication is the one between the recursive server and the successive authoritative servers that do the queries after each iteration that Carlos mentioned in order to obtain that reply. So specifically DNSSEC of those two segments of communication, DNSSEC acts in the second segment, the one that communicates between the recursive server and the successive authoritative servers that it consults along the way. So this is what we tried to show as a non-reliable, non-trustworthy channel, because a DNS protocol in its initial specification, and like Carlos explained, does not consider any kind of mechanism in order to avoid or some kind of defense mechanism against the fact against an attack of man in the middle. So they exchange the data, so the recursive, ser recursive server will reach something different than the authoritative server. And the DNS protocol does not have a mechanism to prevent this from happening. And they cannot verify whether someone gained access to an authoritative server or change something in the zone. And when the recursive server does agree to that zone, if any modification happened, it will send the result. And the recursive server has no choice but to accept that. That is why the concept of extending the DNS protocol came up. This is what we call DNS sec, an anecdote that I always liked, and sometimes we don't tell it, but it's good to be aware of it, is the following. One of the strongest motivations, as far as I understand, that took place, you know, there's always someone who participates in ITF and say, well, that was not exactly like I recall it, but let me tell you how I think it happened. So one of the major motivations to develop the DNS sec was a type of attack which is a cache poisoning. And going back in time, this consists in someone, if you are aware that the recursive servers, after doing their query, the uh, uh, authoritative and send their reply back, they keep that reply in case another client does the same query, and they don't have to go out and find the answer. It was already answered once, it's stored, and then I get that answer. So the place where that answer is stored is a cache that's not stored forever, but for a given period of time. And after that time, if someone asks the same thing, I have to look for it once again. So there's an attack that attacks the recursive server trying to modify what has been stored in the cache, or they include something false in the cache, like a false IP address. So that's called the cache poisoning. And DNS prevents this from happening. If DNSSEC is properly deployed, DNSSEC will prevent that type of attack. So what does DNSSEC do? DNSSEC uses public key cryptography and digital signatures in order to provide two things, origin authentication 
So to be sure that the information I received from authoritative server is really the information that the authority included in that server and not information that was modified and also provides data integrity. In other words, the data I received from the authoritative server and I received are the same ones that nobody modified this in between and that I received things that are not the ones that the authoritative server really sent to me. So DNSSEC also provides protection against data forging of DNS and prevents attacks such as cash poisoning as well as mitigating other types of attacks. Others are resolved, others are uh, mitigated and on the dark side of the panda, well, what does DNSSEC not do? Well, there are many attacks that obviously DNSSEC cannot solve. For example, denial of service attacks. So they could be sending a lot of traffic to fill my communications channel, the uplink of, for example, generating many TCP sessions to consume all the ports. So in that case, DNSSEC does not avoid that kind of attacks. So there are other mechanisms to solve this. And DNSSEC does not provide confidentiality in data exchange. DNSSEC does not encrypt the data that the authoritative server sends to the recursive server, and it does not encrypt the data submitted by the recursive server to the client. So there are other technologies, there are other protocols for that purpose. For example, the previous segment, the white client of a recursive server, you have those protocols which are quite recent. If I, we look at history, like the history of internet, like DOH, DOT, and others. So, and in the second uh, stretch, there are also some technologies that are being developed uh, at uh, IEDF, but that is confidentiality. And uh, DNSSEC doesn't give uh, confidentiality. It gives, uh, uh, it confirms both the origin and uh, integrity of the data. So before we delve into DNSSEC, uh, uh, to facilitate its understanding. Let's talk about uh, encrypting uh, and uh, digital signatures. And let's try, uh, Panda would try to do it in a user-friendly way, as simple as possible. Well, it, it, it's a difficult uh, topic, there's no doubt. I'm so happy you have to do it, Nico. Yes, this is uh, terrible, but let's try to do it easy so let's leave the dns stack uh, on the desk uh, for a second and let's talk about uh, encrypting and the digital signature first we're going to speak of the hash function the hash function is a function that is mathematically complex and uh, many of the things uh, that are there are beyond me i'm not uh, an expert there and uh, in practice the usage that we give is much more simple to understand and it's not so complicated. What is a hash function? It's a function that we would take a text, a set of data. I'm going to apply the hash function and what it, it will give me back uh, is a chain of characters with a fixed uh, length. That's the most important thing, one of the most important things. And the other important thing is that the hash function is not, the is, is not reversible. That is, in the original text, the original data, I apply the hash function and I obtain a chain of characters, an alphanumeric chain with a fixed length. Regardless of the size of the original data or text, it may be one line, it could be 5,000 pages. Um, if for any text I apply the same uh, hash uh, function, the result is always an alphanumeric uh, uh, chain of uh, fixed uh, um, uh, length. And if I have the result of a hash and I want to get the original data, I cannot do it. So. It's 
it uh, is reversed. The thing is that it shouldn't be reversible. Uh, there we put an example. Uh, it tells me, yes, I'm the panda of uh, DNSSEC, and here I put, uh, I'm the panda of DNSSEC, and we apply an MD5, a hash function, and this is a result that we obtained. This is a numeric chain. You see that it has a certain length, but it's quite reasonable. The size is quite reasonable, and then we put this other text here, it basically explains in English what uh, an Ibsen is. It's much longer than I'm the, uh, the NSEC panda. And we apply the same uh, function of the hash and we get another alphanumeric chain of the same length that we had obtained uh, earlier. So notice that it has little text, a certain length, a lot of text and the same length. So this re hash result is completely different from this other one and that's the other big characteristic and probably the most important of the hash is that anything that i change in the original text if you uh, uh, if i apply this it changes the result so in a way we can say that the result of the hash function um, is uh, a digital signature that is unique for the original text so if I change a bit, uh, the, then it continues to be the same length, but the string changes. So the hash function converts the data into a certain number of characters with a fixed uh, length uh, that is uh, the uh, unique uh, length that is not reversible. So now let's check the private and the public uh, keys that has more to do with encrypting. When we speak of encrypting, I like to mention two big groups, the symmetric and asymmetric. What is encrypting? I may be boring you. It's encrypting basically is to apply some mathematical uh, uh, formula to a set of data, obtaining something that is directly related or correlated with the original text. But if I read it, if the original data are a, a readable text, the result doesn't make sense. So it has a lot of changes. The mathematical functions change a lot of things in the original text for that result not to be readable by a third party wishing to read it. Now, the characteristic that it has, differing from what we said in the hash in the case of encrypting symmetric or asymmetric, is that it is reversible. And that's the fun of it. Is that the, that's the interesting thing about encrypting. Though, if I have that text encrypted, I should have a mechanism to once again have the original text. So in the case of symmetric encrypting, the key that I use to encrypt is the same as is used for uh, disencrypting. So I, if I, I have a text, I apply the key and I encrypt it. And it's something that doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it cannot be read. But if I have that encryption and I apply the same function with the same key, I can uh, remove the encryption and I'll have uh, the original text. In the case of the a asymmetric encrypting, that's what DNSSEC uses. The difference with what we just explained is that the key with which you encrypt is not the same. It's not the same as the one that you use to disencrypt. Uh, so this asymmetric encryption that's called as a public uh, key and private key uses two keys. What one, so you saw the difference. So it's called public, they are called public and private keys that may be confusing, but the two of them can encrypt or de-encrypt. But if I use one to encrypt necessarily, I have to use the other one to disencrypt. 
the what uh, the private key encrypts only the public one can be used the same key cannot do the same two functions on the same text so what i um i i, I must use the different keys and now comes uh, defining or trying to explain what a digital signature is First, let's think of what it would be for. Basically, it serves for anything as uh, the same as a handwritten signature uh, in, a, in a letter. So we, we send a letter and we want the person to read it, to be able to check that I wrote it, to authenticate the origin. If Nicolas then signs a paper, then I would, uh, if I want to authenticate that, I should go to an expert that will compare my signature with the one in my ID card. And so, so there's a whole science behind it. For me, it's impossible, but the people who know about it and devote their lives to that can tell them apart. They, they can know whether uh, it was even the same person that did it. So there should be a certain level of training to be able to recognize whether it's really the same person or somebody else tried to forge it. In the digital case, this is a, uh, much simpler in a certain way, because that uh, dexterity is automated. So the digital signature is used just the same as the written signature. And it is in this case to authenticate the origin of a certain document of a certain set of data. How can, how is this digital signature get uh, generated as follows? I have the text that I want to sign. I apply first the hash function. Remember that if I apply the hash function, the result is uh, chain with a fixed length. Then I encrypt that with a private key. So I have encrypted something that is what we know as the digital signature. If somebody wanted to validate that signature, what should they do? Well, first of all, when I sign a text, a letter, for instance, the person that I want to validate, I want I have to send two things, the signature, sorry, the, but also the letter. And I have to send the letter in a readable uh, text because if I encrypt it, they, then they can't read anything. So I send the text clear as it's written and the signature. As we are using asymmetric uh, encrypting, in addition to sending the original data and the signature of those data, I will have to send the public key because I remember that I generated um, that with uh, the private. Uh, so I have to use, send the public. So I am the only one who knows that. So I, I send uh, the original data, the key, and then he has to, the other one has to take uh, the public key, apply it to the signature and de-encrypt uh, the signature, and then he will obtain the hash. I encrypt it with the hash with a private uh, key, and I use the other one, uh, the pub, uh, to de-encrypt it. So the person who wants to validate it has the hash that it took from uh, the signature. And notice that, I was the only one that could uh, generate that hash because uh, I, uh, the only one that encrypted uh, this was uh, the one that had the private key. So when I de-encrypted, um, the person who's doing that knows that the only one that could generate that hash was I. So now they have to see whether the hash corresponds to the text, but they have the original text because I sent it. So they, they, <coughs> put away that hash and they apply the same hash function to the original uh, text. It's the same thing that I did before signing it. And then they obtain the hash of the original and um, compare it to, and if the two hashes match, it's that Nicolas was the one who signed this. If, the, if they don't coincide, then something happens. Either the text changed or the signature is not the right one. And somebody wanted uh, to, uh, somebody, 
signed uh, something that was not correct. So every, this is based on the fact that nobody knows my private key and that everybody knows my public key. Any questions so far? Any doubts? So is everything calm? Did everybody leave for lunch? Well, there are two questions. Would you rather hear them now? Yes, maybe. Yes, <clears throat> let's fasten our seatbelts. Well, the, the hash part is, is quite dense. Yes, it's a bit dense. So my first question is by Daniel Stephen Contreras Reis. Good afternoon. We are an ISP and we do NAT with our IP blocks. We configure a DNS with master and slave, name service, B TRS, MX, and other registers, but we are having some problems with some PABLs since they block some of our OPs, if not all. Uh, what, what is PBL public blacklist? And he asked, what should we review? Well, th that may happen. It's not directly related to, not necessarily to DNSSEC. We can see this and maybe we can leave that for later for dessert. Yes, because I have comments about that. Yes, it's probable it may have something to do with NAT because you have a lot of Java NAT because we see many, uh, it, it's possible that one of those in NAT are blocking because they're doing something that they shouldn't, but Nico, maybe we should leave that for later. This has to do with the reverses and with NAT and the ports and all the rest. It's a path that has no, has no return. So what can we do to improve the DNSSEC? What tools do you recommend? Well, we have many tutorials, many have been recorded. Well, one of the big recommendations, Carlos, if you wish to have a deep dive, for example, you can check the RFCs, the standard definitions. So you should go in the standards, the DNSSEC standards, and you have to take some time to read these. Well, of course, but this is really to have a really deep dive. A deep dive, it has all the specifications. Jonathan, you know, I started, and this was back in 2010, with a PowerPoint presentation that was made at the DNSSEC tutorial by the people at RIPE. The our friends from Europe, if you look this up, RIPE DNSSEC tutorial, it's in English, it's a bit outdated. Some of the things that they recommend in that tutorial are not appropriate in current in the current situation, but it's a good material to start with. It's 140 slides, but it's quite a complex issue. Well, I was looking at another question from Raul, Raul MH. If both have to apply the same type of cash. Well, as we saw, when you are doing the hash, both the one who generates a signature, for example, I was generating in my example, this based on the original Texas, I was generating the hash and then encrypting with my private key, who does the decryption and compares this with the hash they do of the uh, original hash has to be the one, the one that I did when I encrypted this. So the hash function is well known. Yes, go on, go on. And that is also something that we really have to say in addition to i'm simplifying things once again i don't want to make things complicated at this stage but what i'm interested in is that what the hash is the hash is to apply this function to the original text which is not reversible and gives me a chain of of characters which is the original print and then what the public key does is disencrypted decrypted by the public key. I wanted to add on to what Raul was saying exactly. 
not only the hash has to be the same, the same algorithm, the one for generating the key has, key has to be the same algorithm. That's why I don't, we have, think we have time for this, but many of the DNS registered records have the indicator of the algorithm, and sometimes it's algorithm five or eight or 13. Each of these identifiers of algorithm identify a couple of things. Uh, uh, one algorithm for the keys and one for the hash. This is because somehow, and it's a great question, Raul, MH, the two extremes have to agree. Otherwise, it's very difficult to identify the digital signature. In addition to the hash, Raul, and in addition to knowing the algorithm of the hash, you also have to know the encrypting algorithm, because if I have a public and private keys, if I don't know what decrypting decryption algorithm is, if I try to apply a key that is different from the one that was used for encryption, then it won't work. So the hash algorithms and encryption algorithms also have to be reported to all those who wish to validate this. And we're going to see this, we're going to see this in we go to the zone signing uh, part. We can do the five, the eight, or others in future editions. And there are some interesting things to comment on. One of the most interesting things, in fact, of the design of DNSSEC, because I think the design of the protocol is excellent as such, is that the DNSSEC contemplates that you have signatures with different algorithms at the same time in such a way that you can do transitions both of keys or algorithms and themselves. You can migrate from one algorithm to another because you can show signatures done with a couple of old algorithms and signatures done with a couple of new algorithms and then eliminate these as the old one no longer is used. And we call these the rollovers. It's one of the most amazing things that can be easily done with DNSSEC. Yes, that is what allows us to do the following. If in the future, and this has happened, you know, with the SH81, if an algorithm becomes sufficiently weak in order to start using one that is safer, what Carlos said about going from one to another without the need of being sometime without an encryption algorithm, that is a key point because you have to apply a new algorithm. I turn off the older one and do things without encryption, then I interrupt the chain of trust. And then we would have to start from scratch. So it's a whole issue. And why is that so important? Because the digital signatures of DNS signatures are cached as is done with any register. So there are situations in which you have to show the signatures done with the previous algorithm before withdrawing these because they're intermediate zone. For example, the keys that could be cached and might not reflect the new ones. So this has to go hand in hand with this role. In fact, this is quite a complex uh, st uh, process. You have to create the new ones, you have to wait for TTLs of the records, or uh, to prepare the role and then extend the TTL. So it does have its, its issues. I have a comment from Danyan. Maybe you can send this comment on who is, we don't have much time left very rapidly. I would like to finish this presentation. It's going to be very rapidly. We have zero seconds left. There are a couple of slides as from now on. So fasten your seat belts as from now. Those who wish to deepen on this concept and look into greater details. Um, so the implementation of what I said could be a bit more difficult to digest, at least if we don't have so much knowledge about this, which is what normally happens to us. We're all ignorant of more than 99% of all things. So to learn this right from the outset altogether is not so easy. So what does DNSSEC do? DNSSEC basically takes all that that Carlos said that was in the zone files are A files and IPv4 address associated to a name, IPv6 associated to a name, 
the DMX record, all those things stored by the distributed uh, database will be signed by NSA. The owner of each zone will sign all its records. All the things that are published will be signed, and it will give to all those who do the queries for those records, for those, it will give four things, basically. It will provide the information which is doing the query up, query about, it will provide the information. In addition to providing that information, it will be giving the signature of that information. In addition to the signature, it will be giving the public key so that it can decrypt that signature, compare the hashes and check whether that information is, is valid or not. Or if it was modified in between the full thing that will be provided are the algorithms that are used for the cache and those that are used for encryption, so it can do all the validation of the signatures. So information, signature, and a mechanism to validate that signature. That is what DNS does, and that's, that is the most important thing that I wish to leave here. Now, very rapidly, and to finish with my presentation, this would be the status of a communication between a recursive server and an authoritative server when there's no DNSSEC. And when we do have DNSSEC, this is the status of the communication. So before it was just this part, the central part, where the authoritative, he cracks himself, he, the authoritative sent the recursive, the recursive, the information, only the reply with the queried data. Now, in addition to submitting this data, it will take this information, the original information, it will be coded. In other words, the hash will be applied, it will be encrypted, and the signature for that information will be obtained. So the recursive server will receive the signature and the information, in addition to the public key and the mathematical algorithms used for all this, so that the same thing can be done the other way around. So those who receive this, the recursive server, will take the signature and the information, it will decrypt the signature, the hash, compare the two hashes, and if the signatures coincide, I validate the orig origin. This information provides the original one, the true one, and I provide the answer to the end user. If it is not validated, the information is not passed on, and I tell the end user that the information was not found. Now, and that, of course, is, is discarded. I don't store it in the cache because that DNS, that was not validated by the DNSSEC. With that, AIM, DNSSEC, adds a couple of registries, these records. But we have the DNS key, which that's the one that stores the public key, the key that I have to tell everyone in order to validate the signature. That is DNSK. Then the RRSIG is a signed resource, are the signed resource records. I have the information, the signature, and the public key. The signature is what is stored in the RR SIG, and the public key is stored in the DNS key record. I'm going to skip the explanation as to how this works because we are really past the time. I'm skipping all that part. Let me just finish with this. The only thing that I have to comment so that this is clear to you is what this here. This is the old problem of who does the auditing of the auditor. I signed a text, for example, and those who receive it validate it, and they know that I signed it. Now, there is a problem with all this, namely that you might know me and you see me when I sign a text because you know what my signature looked like. So that's like in my ID document. In my ID document, you have my signature. So anyone can verify this. And the organization charge of issuing the identity documents verifies that that really was my signature. But this is something you don't have here because all this virtual world is different. So the problem that we have here that we didn't have with the ID document is who certifies that that is really my signature. I don't know if you follow me. So 
someone really has to say that that is in fact my signature in the written world you do this when you look at the id document but in this other world that hierarchy of dns that explained colors where you have parents and and so on if you uh, do a zone delegation the owner of that zone will sign all its the resources and pub and publish the key and so on and that will generate a new record which is called ds the ds record the ds record is nothing else than the hash of the signature it's the signature of the original document and what i'm going to do is in addition to publishing that to everybody i'm going to take that digital signature that i generated i'm going to apply a hash and i'm going to give it to my father it is the uh, the zone that gave me the authority and what he will do he will sign it so he is certifying that i'm the one who i claim to be and that with each father so going up in the dns tree now what happens with the root then it's the the root doesn't have any father because that's a definition of a tree so who certifies the root who validates that the signature of the validator has not been altered uh well that's where i want to quote i i like to to uh, quote um, the uh, uh lord of the rings that uh, one key to rule them all and so the mechanism that exists to certify that the the, uh, the root signature is the correct one is the so-called root signature mechanism that those are the ceremonies uh, that we'll leave for another, another chapter so each father signs uh, a daughter uh, and uh, and so i i there is a, a mechanism that was established in 2010 and that ensures the signature of the root well nico we have to leave thank you andrea thank you nico, nico did you manage to eat yes yes it's still here in my esophagus <laughs> well so let's go to the lab well carlos maybe very briefly, let's try and do it. I've been looking at the questions. Good idea. While people come into the room, we might answer some. I can start with one and then it's your turn. Well, there's one here that Maximiliano Colu said, um, and it says, how do you know whether the public key that uh, the server sense is the real one. Uh, so how, how do you know that? Well, because it is the one that you sign and you put all that in the registry and you send it to the parent. So what certifies the validity of the key is the father, the parent of that zone and, and going up to the root. And for certifying the root, we saw that um, you use the protocol um, so that would be the way you can val uh, validate that uh, the signature has not been forged so while carlos uh, uh, answers uh, the phone i let me answer another one but we also already saw this one what is the yield impact that it has using normal dns vis-a-vis -vis the dns stack daniel ernesto daniel asks so what's the impact for instance uh, uh, validating dns stack let's be clear the impact that it will have on a dns server depends on the type of dns server and a lot of factors it depends on uh, the load of that server there are several factors that may have an impact if we are speaking only of a recursive it's not authoritative of any error zone but it's recursive it receives from the clients 
the queries, find the question, and sends it back to the client. That's a recursive one. If I have a recursive server with no DNSSEC, it doesn't validate DNSSEC at a proposed to validate DNSSEC. Obviously, that will overburden the server a bit because now it will have to do some cryptographic uh, operations precisely to check uh, those signatures of the resources that uh, they didn't receive in the past and they were not validating them. And now, it's, uh, you, you, so you have to bear that in mind. But today, really, if we speak of uh, more, uh, servers that are more or less modern, the load or the burden is much less than you would expect. Uh, um, and there are specific servers that have hardware for cryptographic operations that speed up uh, the work and remove, relieve some of the burden. Uh, so my suggestion would be, of course, validation is something that we should all do today. That's not under debate. I think whether you like it or not, everybody operating with recursive servers, we need to start validating. So as everything in life, it's not just that you, it's not plug and play. You need to monitor it. You need to see how the burden increases. And if I see that it starts using up too many resources, then I may have to trigger some mechanism to expand the hardware, if that's the problem. And if I have any topology, for instance, I have a server farm, not one recursive server, but several. By increasing the recursive uh, servers and distributing the load, in the end, I will be able to solve the potential impact. But in recursive server, it's not so much. There is an impact because of the cryptographic uh, issue, but not as significant as one would uh, typically think. And in the case of the authoritative servers, I think that there, the greatest impact is on the operations and not on the server because the information, usually you have to sign on the resources that you have there in the area and put all that information in the uh, zone file. And you can do that in that server, another server and load it there. And besides, it's not that you are doing uh, such uh, operations nonstop. So it's, oh, there's, there is, uh, a burden or um, because you have to sign and you have to validate, but it's not on the equipment, but on the people. Yes. Johnny Alexander Duque, what happens if uh, the uh, uh, if the signatures are due, uh, that's that's a good one. Now, the issue of the time of validity is similar to the validity. Remember when I talked about the status uh, of, of the responses? When you are asked, when you ask a recursive that's validated with a name and somewhere, in the chain of recursion, there is a signature that is either invalid or due. The behavior is going to be the same. As a matter of fact, the answer that you will get is a specific status. It's like a generic uh, uh, thing. And what you will have in the end is a new response. It's a response of error. There's a behavior that's interesting because it's not too intuitive. There are certain responses that are empty or void and that fell, they crashed. It's a strange thing that you have. If, for instance, you ask a, a query with a name that doesn't exist, you go to the NX domain. When you have an X domain and that is cached, if if you ask the same immediately, even if you generated the name somewhere else, and you won't obtain a response because the recursive was has a cached X domain. But uh,
there's uh well i i think that would be all nico those would be the questions you are muted that yes I see that there are 150 people. When Nico puts uh, his scenario together, it, it, what Nico's saying is wonderful, wonderful. I, and I hope so, that some of you can enjoy it. Yes, yeah, so do I, so do I. So as everything in life, the demo may is, is quite tricky. Yes, some comments. First of all, the dynamic will be as follows. Carlos already gave you through the Discord group that was assigned to this tutorial. It gave you some tools that you could download, download and install at home. Basically, it was a number of scripts that are very good, and they solve the big problem of having to install everything manually just to have your laboratory together and ready. What Carlos did makes it much, much more simple. Maybe you downloaded it and in your equipment, you already have the infrastructure running, and basically there you will have, please correct me, Carlos, if. I'm wrong, but you'll have a resolver, a recursive server, an authoritative server, and you'll have to use the tool and uh, generate a zone and sign it. And everything that we do in the lab, you can do it on that platform. So those of you who already have downloaded it and are ready to use it in the lab, you can perfectly well follow the steps that we do now in uh, the settings and you do it on that platform. On the other hand, there's another platform that we have prepared for today that is in the cloud. Those of you who have not managed to install it or do not have equipment powerful enough uh, to use the Vista box and all those things, what we're going to do now is to tell you how you're going to be able to somehow assign yourselves a group. We're going to call it a group. It's a number of a set of uh, virtual devices, and nobody cares where they actually are. It's a sort of uh, as if they were different PCs running onto Linux uh, and uh, each group or each person may reserve a group. They're going to be one group of person and that group will have basically assigned a client, uh, an equipment that is going to use for queries as if you were a client, two recursive servers, two public authoritative servers, one SOA and a cold server, and uh, many other things that you won't use them because it's 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 there already implemented in the platform so what we are going to do now is before we start those of you who want to make use of one of or, or to assign yourselves in one of those groups i'm going to tell you how a couple of clarifications and i'm going to take a few minutes for this please first of all be very sweet with the platform do it lovingly because it it's uh it's being uh, uh tested uh, as there are many engineers here um sometimes we only just to see whether you can do it we try to do things but with colors what we ask you is that the equipment that you have and you will be assigned you access as a route so those machines can do whatever you want, but we ask you not to do some things. They can be done, but you don't need to try them. So if you can do everything that you can do when a, a machine is a root, but please don't download, don't use a PTNet or PT install because it's, you're going to generate uh, traffic and there's too many uh, machines and so during the tutorial at least refrain from downloading 
So everything that you already have installed, you have it. And what you haven't installed, there, you don't need it. So please be gentle with the platform. So the, and I hope that some of you make good use of it. If you want one of those machines to use later, the platform will be running until tomorrow. And uh, so you you can do it in and those you can also do it in parallel with Carlos and myself. And if not, once this tutorial is over, you can make yourself a sandwich and a cup of coffee and you start to repeat this in the lab. It is published and the machines will be inactive. So you'll be able to play with this until tomorrow. So the only thing I have left to say is I will give you the mechanisms to have access to the practice and to the equipment. And another thing that is not such good news is that I see that we are 150 people connected. And there's only room for 50. Huh. So when we get to 50, you won't be able to enter any groups. But I assume that many of you downloaded the platform that Carlos published in uh, the Discord. And in the future, we can put together a lab precisely for this, so many of you can participate. I'm going to put in the chat while you show this, I'm going to put the link. What I'm putting there is a link to a repository. And what you're going to have there is, you're going to have two letters of the lab. Nuevamente la letra de esa que está mostrando Nicolás, que es la letra de esta actividad que vamos a hacer con el, con el lab en línea que, que armó Nico. One is the one for the lab online, and you'll have another letter, which is for those who want to run this locally in your own machines, and that you have two software pieces installed. You will be able to run this in your own machine without having to do anything online, and you can do this at your own pace, no matter how long it takes. So you can choose the one you prefer. You have to clone the repository. Or if you're going to do the activity with an online lab, you don't need to do anything because you can read this directly either from Nico's screen or from your own browser. I will try and pay attention. <clears throat> Carlos, what I suggest is at a, as an initial step and to summarize for those who wish to follow the practice, to access the link that Carlos sent and leave that open in another tab so you can follow the script. Did you send the two links? This for going to use a platform and the other one? Yes, these are two files. One says lab icon, that's the one going to do online and LAN authoritative recursive is the one to run, you're going to use run locally. So I suggest that you use the two so you can follow the practice without the need to watching the shared screen in Zoom. So the first thing that I will do now So let's see if things run well. And I'm going to paste a link here, which you will use to access. And that's a form. It's a Google form where you just have to enter your name and your email address. The, e the email is optional because you have to include your name. Once you fill in this form and just do this only once, just send the form only once with your name and automatically it will be assigning to you a group. I will share the link with you so that you see what group you have been assigned to. And once you have been assigned to a group, that's the group you'll be using for the entire lab. La Nico, did you put the link? Yes, yes, there it is. Perfect. So that's the form and only once. <clears throat> I'm going to copy it. <clears throat> Please complete it only once. And after that, 
Then after you fill in this form, you access this other site, really? this other okay. URL, which is to see which group you have been assigned to. And once you access this second URL, which I included here, you will have something that looks like this here on the screen. This is a shared screen. And if you pay attention, here we'll start seeing the names of those who filled in the form. For example, I was assigned group one, Carlos group number two, Rodrigo group number three, Jose Ramirez number four, Juan Pablo has group number five, and I suggest entering your name and your surname because some names might be repeated. Just is so that you know what group you have been assigned to. In my case, I'm in group number one. So what I have to recall is that group number one. I'm only going to be able to access the resources of group number one. One of the things that we have to be careful with with this lab is because you don't have to register, we cannot send you the keys specifically to each one of you. So I'm going to share all the keys to everyone, everyone's keys. So please access only those groups which are yours groups. So it's not to interfere with the work and configuration of other people. And once again, if anyone wishes to send a message to Carlos or me, and we can organize another lab separately so that you can then work on this at home. Let's wait a bit more. Carlos, would you like to add any comments while they register? No, that was it. And I'd like to repeat Nico's request of please bearing with us for a while. This is great, but you know, it does have its complexities. Don't feel stressed if you cannot do everything. Remember that you'll have some more time in order to continue using this, or you can also have the option of doing some things exclusively in your laptops. So just a bit of patience and let us enjoy this. It can be most entertaining. So I think it's just got stuck here. There is room for 50. So don't be afraid, just register. So please don't be afraid as long as, long as there's space for everyone, try to do some of these things. We're going to be guiding you along. And the lab will be left online, so you can also continue doing this. And one of the good things about this is that it's a real configuration, the things that you configure here, and of course, not the zone names, but the things that you configure here will be useful to you because this will be like templates to do simple production uh, templates. Configurations. We get to configuration on a real server. This platform will not be creating a false route. The system and in the public domain name and the laboratory has been assigned a domain, and you're going to be creating authoritative servers below that domain, and those servers through to the public server of the lab can be accessible from anywhere, but not downwards because it has private addressing. The lab has private addressing. So when a public recursive does uh, queries, of course, they won't be able to reach the private one. But inside the laboratory, you will be able to solve this and will be doing your queries to the real DNS. It's de poder hacer esto en la nube. And this is one of the interesting things to be able to do this in the cloud and not uh, the simulation. And the route, yes, is simulated. Correct. So, Carlos, yes, that's correct. Perfectly correct. We have Townhouse there. That's a friend. 
Ya les digo, los que quieren, anímense, hay espacio. So, there's still time for more people. There are 40 groups available. And let me repeat once again that even out of curiosity, you can try this out, register a machine. And this is also useful for us to assess how the platform performs. So remember the group you have been assigned to, once you have been assigned that group, so this is the interesting part I'm going to include here so that you can download the, these are the files of the keys for the clients, as I said, like Spider-Man said, with more power, you have more responsibility. So we ask you to treat this gently, the groups that you have not been assigned to. So there are 40 groups that are free, so you don't need to access other people's machines. Now, here you're going to download two files separated by commas. They are CSDs of values separated by commas, and you have the list of the servers with a comma and the key to access the server and the list of clients and the key to access the clients. If you pay attention, you will see that the client file includes the clients assigned to each of the groups. So you will see clients group, client group, etc. And the one of the servers has a series of servers assigned to each of the groups. All the servers of one group will have the same key. No matter if they're all listed there, if you look at the key for the server of a given group, they're all the same. So we now have to give you the URL of the laboratory so that you can access the machines. And to access the machines, we're going to use a kind of SCH over HTTPS, but it's more or less like that. We are running a server that ends up giving you a shell window, a command line through a HTTPS page, a website, using the HTTPS. So you access this site, that's the domain that has been assigned to this laboratory, LACNIC 35 TLAMPS dot training, and this is what you should see here. This is the list of all the devices that can be accessed. So I have been assigned group one, for example, and I have all these devices that I selected here that I'm highlighting on the screen. Can you see the highlight on the screen? Yes, we have. Okay, all these devices up here, are the ones that have been assigned to device one, then for group two, for group three. And like I was saying, each one of you will have a client which has a CLI, two authoritative servers in NS1, NS2, two recursive servers that we're not going to make them public, we need to configure them so that they can only be accessed by our clients, not from the rest. And one SOA server, which is the authoritative hidden server, I'm going to generate a zone, we're going to sign it, and NS1 and NS2, which are the public authoritative servers, these are going to be included as secondary servers. And using the XFRR for zone transfer, we're going to configure this so that they can automatically configure for the primary one, and the other ones will be responding to the queries, to authoritative queries that reach my domain, my zone. So to access this, there are two ways. One is to click on the link, and this opens a new label. The one I suggest is instead of clicking, what you can do is to copy the URL of the device you wish to access and to paste it on another window in the browser, automatically you will see to the, you are asked to answer yes. If you, and there you are asked to put the key of sysadmin. This is the key that you have in the file separated by comma that you downloaded. I'm to look up the one that for the device I'm accessing, that is client of group number one. I'm going to look up the password. This is a file password key, and this, I'm going to copy that key. I'm going to paste it here. 
if you are using the browser you can copy it and here to paste it you do click on the right paste from browser you click there and you put ok and then you enter and there you can access the device as user without privileges and there i can well the things i do here are the things you should not do but anyway i don't need to change as well i just don't need to clean it so i leave it like that there I access the client. I'm now going to access my server. I'm going to access my server, SOA server. He corrects himself. I'm going to access the result one, which is the one I'm going to configure first of all. I'm going to copy the URL once again, and I paste it in a different window. So all the devices that have been assigned are open so that I can change from one to another. If you change shift windows, you maintain these active. From here, I'm going to change the key for root, which is the same key, and then access. Carlos, do you have any comments? So, so. Entonces, Go ahead. So I'm going to show you the script. And the first thing is the topology here of this laboratory. This is what each group has. Once you have a group, this is what is assigned to you. The laboratory has emulated like a kind of backbone. Here you have internet, the rest of the internet. And each group has a router that is connected to this backbone and that router in addition to the network to the backbone is connected to the lan which is the network we're going to use where we have our client and one called int which is the internal one or protected service and then we need to put all the servers that the, we don't want to be public like the authoritative occult server soa and the recursive servers these recursive servers will only be left open for our clients and not for the rest of the world that is why they are in the internal network and then there's a third network the dmz which is are those authoritative servers that by definition are public otherwise they don't come uh, comply with the functionality. So this is to show you how all these virtual machines are connected, which you connect to. And this is the addressing that each one has. For example, I have been assigned group number one. X is the group number. So my LAN is 100, 100, 0, slash 26, and this other one here. And all the network, all the prefix that has been assigned to my group is 100, 100, uh, X, uh, 0, slash, 24. So this is the prefix that uh, uh, globes uh, all my network. What I have here is the uh, assignment of IP addresses for each device. It's more friendly than this. So my client has the address 100, 101, because mine is 1, 2, and my server Yes, authority, my authoritative servers have 130 and 132. Recursives have 100, 100, 167, and 168. Forget about these, because in this practice, we won't access the router. We won't play with this. And the and uh, what we are going to configure for this area it's 100, 100, 1, 66, 66. And we'll need this for queries and for the different servers. And here we have explained what each server is. So that's all. Let's configure our first candidate to configure. The first thing that we're going to configure is a recursive server based on NAN, uh, on BAM. But you know that bind, bind can be used both for recursive server or authoritative. We're going to configure it, configure it exclusively as recursive in this case. There I see in the Q&A that somebody is not uh, being accepted the password. The problem probably is 
how the way you are cutting and pasting. What you have to do is to copy the password as you would copy with a control C or with a C command P if you have a Mac and to copy the file separated by commas and then the best way to access the, the equipment um, is don't uh, select it, copy the URL of the server that you want to access. That's resolved two of group one in my case, I paste it. And when I'm asked this, I say yes. And here to paste the password of resource two of group one, I copy the password of the text in, um, in commas, write key, and then I open the navigator, I paste the password and they there I okay and then enter. You have to do this only once, and it should have no. You should have no problems. <laughs> no, it's not being. It's not accepting it. You're right. I pasted that of group two instead of a group one. Things happen. So let me copy the right uh, password. I was giving the the wrong group, and here I came in. You see, and the same thing is to going from user to super user there. And here I paste the password again. There. Once uh, you access this, I'm going to go to resolve one. That's the first one that we are going to configure. And as I said, if you can't access, as you have the group assigned when the tutorial is is over, we can communicate. Carlos, you must be cautious. They're not the same. They're not, or are they the same? Well, that the client is one password and that of the service, all the servers in the same group have the same password, but that of the client is different. Now it's not the same password. That's why there are two password files. There are two password files, Carlos Gutierrez, as that of the clients and the service. Each group has only one client, but five servers, the two resolvers, the two authoritative and the uh, occult authoritative. So let's go on, Carlos. As you already have the machine resolved, uh, we'll tell you how to access and you can test it today and tomorrow. We'll have both days. So let's go to the recursive server configuration. It's based on bind and we are going to use the resolve one that already has bind uh, installed. So what we have here is a machine that if you go change to ATC slash ETC slash bind and here you see that we have the entire bind installed brand new as it comes when you do the APD install bind. So we start from there as it would happen in real world when you are configuring a server from scratch. So the first thing that we are going to do as a root server, we're going to go to the bind directory. I change it to the bind directory. And now that we have this directory, we're going to see that if we list the contents of that directory, all of those are the files inside of it. In particular, these uh, named conf local and named conf options and named conf and named conf default zones, all of these are the configuration, the bind configuration files. They already come by default with a, a configuration that in some cases we won't need to uh, change, but in our case, we will have to. In this case, that we are configuring a recursive bind server and in this lab that we won't configure everything. There are many things and it's security and fine tuning of the server, et cetera, that we won't do uh, because, and uh, please consider that there are many more options that you can 
uh, used, but we are going to do the minimum that will operate the best way possible. So the file that we're going to edit is named conf options. So I go to the bind directory and I'm going to edit. I like to use the nano. If you like to use me, you can use it. If, if you like any other editors already installed, that's fine, but if not, use the or nano that are already installed. We're going to edit this file named conf options. We edit. And this is how it comes. So let's see what these things mean. These are the comments that explain much of what we said. In particular, what we're, we're interested in here is this is the directory that Vind will use to store many things, including this last action in this directory that keeps uh, the pin file, that is the file that has the information on the IP uh, addresses of the root servers, because it, the, it's, they start when the recursive server asks the root. Yes, remember that the, what you all know where the root is? Well, that is information that is delivered out of band. It comes installed in, uh, in the software of the servers. Yes, and in addition, the bind in this case, well, all the servers actually, or the DNS, the newest versions at least, and well, for, for several years, maintain it updated because that may change. The IP of a root server may change. And so the DNS servers, what they do is they check that and maintain it automatically. And there's a way to, uh, handle it uh, uh, automatically, but we won't discuss that today. These are two very interesting options. DNSSEC validation auto will maintain automatic, everything automated, everything that has to do first with the DNSSEC validation auto enables the DNSSEC validation by the recursive. So I leave it like this and the server bind the latest versions, the one that I have installed here, that is the last one stable, it already comes by default, it validates DNSSEC. So I don't have to enable it. If I just install it and I don't touch anything, it will validate DNSSEC. And as it, it's an automatic mode, it will automatically maintain the information corresponding to the trust anchor. Uh, that is what we said, that's a ceremony of uh, the delivery of uh, the route that is uh, through which we uh, establish the chain of trust, that signature of the root zone, that's what the server will keep automated with this command. If I wanted to do it manual, I could do it. I'm going to have to download the signature in uh, the root area and keep it in the server and Whenever there's a rollover of the root, I'll have to do it by hand. And this is very important because if I have a, a recursive and I roll over the signature and I don't update it because the, it turns out that I had it manual, there my recursive will have an incorrect information for the root zone. So what will happen? All the registries that come signed by DNSSEC and that my server validate well i uh well that uh, that is um, no longer valid so it is important very important first tip for those managing recursive servers with dnssec validation you always need to maintain the anchorage area in the in uh, the root area updated so you do this. It does, this doesn't mean that you don't have to look for the proper file, the one that corresponds to the area of trust of the root zone, and this command manages it. And you 
do a manual verification to check that everything is right, everything is correct, and that the uh, trust uh, anchor is really the right one. So you have to do that. We won't do it here, but you have to do it. So this, so this is what enables this server to use both IPv4 and IPv6. And what are we going to add here for this to be recursive that works the way we want? We're going to add the following. I made a mistake here. There you are. What we're going to add is these options here, this here. Here it says add. And in particular, we are going to add this option that is going to tell a recursive server that will list in port 53, from which prefixes I'm going to listen in port 53 in this server. So basically, what this will do will be to close the recursive server only for queries coming to port 53 coming from the local host and this slash 16 prefix here. Remember that I told you that each group has a slash 24. And uh, so as not to confuse you and to enable new queries so that you won't have to put the group number, we'll open it for the entire platform of the lab. Any questions coming from a prefix that is not the local or this prefix will not be accepted. So you won't answer. It won't give the functionality. It won't answer. This is not an open recursive server. We don't want it to be. We want it to be just for our client. So we don't specify it. Well, we specify it with this prefix. And so I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it in our recursive server. Let me leave some room. Chico, en cinco minutos tendremos un break corto y me preguntan si en realidad queremos hacer el break. Nico, queremos... in five minutes we'll have a short break. I was asked if we would have to, we'd like to have the break or just continue. I would say, if you wish to write in the chat, if anyone wishes to have the break, please include it in the chat. I would suggest the following. Let's not have the break right now. Let we stay here, but we'll give them the 10 minutes to see if those who are having any, having any problems to access, we can help them to do so. So we'll finish this part. We finished configuring the recursive one and then we do that. Okay. 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 Este, entonces agregamos esto. So we add this here in the configuration and then we add this line, which is the equivalent for the IPv6 protocol. This here is a address. This is a prefix, a ULA prefix generated for this laboratory, respecting the RFC as to how the these are uh, generated. And if you look at this here, it's like a pseudo ULA. The, uh, use part of the ULA to use it for each group. But basically this one here is a prefix used by all the platform of the laboratory. And in the same way as we did for IPv4, we're going to do so for IPv6 to leave the recursive server open just for the clients of the laboratory and not for the rest of the internet, although this is a private address and this is a ULA. So this would not be going out into the internet. So let's do, th let's do things as far as possible as what it would be like with a real case. Already, so now we add the configuration for IPv6, and finally we're going to allow, add this thing here, this one here. This is doing a functionality similar to the previous one, and there's a difference between the two. We're not going to go into the details, but this command here says who will be allowed to do the query, not who can access port 53, but who will I be providing the recursive server service. So here we put local host, all those who do query through IPv4 and the query through IPv6. So with this command, 
allow query we're including all the things that we included previously but the difference is that this is exactly who i will be providing this service the recursive service to this coincides with this here so we include it here and we still one, have one more command to configure and then it starts running so the last command and not less important, less important is the one we have here so recursion is not automatically enabled so no matter if we get queries recursive query series with the server has disabled the recursion function so i have to enable it if i don't enable this then it the server is of no use at all it's of no use at all because i want it to be recursive if i wished it to be authoritative when carlos shows the configuration for the authoritative we're not going to authorize this part here so that it's only be it's only an authoritative server even if someone makes the request so having done this the configuration of the bind is ready if you're using bind control x and 10 and enter if you're using the so here we have configured the server we're now going to verify there are a set of options that you have in the bind packet. And this allows me to use this here to check the configuration. What the named check conf does is in the case of the bind, it checks whether the configuration files do not contain errors. It's not that I haven't committed, made an error, but if I made a semantic error if I included an option that is not valid or I skipped a parameter, it's going to show this. It's not going to tell me if I included the incorrect prefix, if I'm filtering like I did for the recursive server so that only my platform can be accessed by my client. I included a different prefix. Well, I'm doomed. Of course, it's not going to verify that. That is what you will have to verify yourself doing the queries and seeing what it returns so we do the we check here i pressed enter and it didn't return anything so no news good news so no errors i got nothing back so if we have time i'd like to do something a couple of more seconds and i'm going to do something just to test it out, I put Nico and I'm going to do a configuration check. Unknown option, Nico. So it sends me back this information. Unknown option, unexpected token here, and it's tell me, it, it shows me the file where I have the error. It's quite easy to detect the error. So I go back and I see this here. I delete this here. So these are things that could happen. So I just delete this here. I delete that line. I delete, I save once again. I check the configuration once again, and there it is ready. So now I have to restart the bind server so that it picks up all the configuration changes I made. I can do it in this way. I use the system control restart and the name of the service that I wish to restart. This is bind nine. I go over here. It hasn't answered anything. And let's see if it didn't say anything because it was complaining. I want to check the status. I change restart for status. And there, I should receive something that looks like this. This green dot here is, this is great. When we see the green dot, this means that the service is active. It is running. And since then, it's just now because I restarted it. And these are the last log messages and information. So in the, whether active or inactive, it can be used to detect any problems. If it, read and the service did not restart it because I have a problem somewhere and then I have to 
check this information here to determine where the error lies. But there is no error at all here. It's just letting us know the things that it is doing. It is showing me that it is managing the keys for the root zone and that it is that that's working, etc. So it's running. So is it working? Does it do a, is it doing the recursion? So we're going to check and we're going to go to our client up here. I had open the client screen, the tab, and I have to check the IP address of my recursive server. So for that, I have the IP at DDR. I see all the interfaces. This is the interface of my recursive server, and this is the IP address that my recursive server has. It is here, and you also have it in the manual. And this is my recursive server, 100, 100, 167. I copy that address, and we do a dig here. We specify the recursive server to the dig. In this case, if you look at the resolve.conf, if I don't tell you what file to use, it is configured to use the recursive server. I think it's a quad nine, 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 but it can use mine, which I have just configured. So I do a recursive query. What would you like me to ask, Carlos? You can ask just anything. What can we ask? Well, let's see if it really works. We, it, it should work. Start with something easy. ICANN.org. Okay. This has nothing to do with the sponsors. Okay. And ta -da! let's see. Great. And this is the answer. So what did I do? I did a query. I didn't specify the type of register of record is IPv4 associated to a given domain. So I did the query for ICANN.org and it gives me the IPv4 associated to ICANN.org. If I put ask for the IPv6 associated to ICANN.org, quad A, it should, in fact, in the answer section, give me the IPv6 address associated to ICANN.org. Now, there's something interesting here with that, uh, that I would like to highlight, Carlos. One is here, the flags and the header. I want to look at this one here specifically, the flag that shows me that this has been validated. It has been authenticated using DNSSEC. Because we have DNSSEC and the recursive server validates DNSSEC and the domain zone ICANN.org is signed DNSSEC, this recursive server that I have that we have just configured in the result will validate this. This is the indicator that it is validating. It is validating DNSSEC. And the fact that I obtain an answer means that the validation was positive because if I do the query of something that has an error in the signature or has incorrect data or something that has that is not validated correct, I will obtain an error. And this is something that we can see if we do a query just hold on, Nico. That's an excellent point to pick up later. Let's have a five-minute break. <laughs> Maximiliano, you can take your bio break. So we are going to do the following. Five minutes break so that those of you who, not can, could, who could not access should let us know in the chat I could resolve this for Nancy. And if anyone else has any issues, if you to reserve a machine and start using it, go ahead. Let me tell you the problem that Nancy had because it might be happening to someone else. When you do click on the link that Nico showed you with the keys, something curious happens. If you have Chrome as your default browser, you might have a window that looks like a form, but it's not that. But if you copy that, what it copies is a GIF. And if you try to paste it in the tab of the browser, 
when we're trying to open the session, it just gives you anything back. So what you have to do, and I tell you because this is something I was quite surprised with, and the same happened to me as it had happened to Nancy. So what you have to do, and I'm share my screen with you for a second. Let's see if I can reproduce this. Just a minute. No, I won't be able to reproduce it. So you're going to see the list of the keys and at the top you have a button which says open with and there you have to click and then you have the long list of things and you have to choose Google Sheets. There might be other options or you can download the file to your machines, but the easiest thing to do with the browser is to open with Google Sheets and then you will have this form and you copy it there and then that does work. I had an experience, Carlos, which was quite unpleasant with that. The first time I used the lab, exactly the same thing happened to me and nobody could enter and I wasn't wondering what was wrong. I tried it 70 times and there was no error. And it was that. In my case, it was even worse because I directly had pasted on a Google form a Google Sheet, but if you don't generate it as a CSV, but if you generate it as a Google Sheet and you open it there, the copy paste from Google Sheets copies characters that you do not see. And when you paste it, it doesn't work. So the recommendation is download it, open it as a TXT file or whatever, the CSV and copy it and paste it there. That doesn't feel copying from a form or from another text processor or any text processing system that you open, it might turn out that you're copying graphs or characters that don't come out on the screen but are there. And this might give you errors. So you can open it in text mode with a, with a notes or something and you won't have any problem there. Is there no, and had, did anyone else have problems to access this? I wasn't paying attention to the form. I see that there are many more, there are about 20 in the form. So if anyone else, else had problems, you can let me know through the chat or through the Q&A or through the Discord. There were some very amusing comments, funny comments in the Discord the battle with the IT and the system G. So that was uh, so much funny. It's like a V and Nano, like that battle. Yes. In my case, I feel more comfortable when I don't have to touch many keys. The problem is moving the cursor. And, and as you touch the arrow, then the cursor doesn't uh, bulge. I prefer that. Well, when I'm about to finish, this makes reassures me because I see when I'm altering the text and when not. The problem, but there's a trick. The trick is when you have the term ill configured, so you touch the dates and everything goes wrong. That's the time of doing escape, escape, and to leave and start again. Yes, the problem is that if you didn't save it, you have to do everything again. No, but you realize immediately because the date is one of the things that you see. There's a way you can move the cursor. Yes, and there it says that the beam, well, the, the arrows work. I, I but the, the problem is when you're connecting to an old, uh, a very old uh, 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 machine. Well, a problem is that the Veeam is a V that wanted to be nano, but uh, didn't manage. Well, I like the one of the kitchen uh, de, uh, detergent that's called Veeam too. What would we do next? Well, 
I'm, I'm going to open my server because I realized that I haven't opened it. So I'm going to go through all the same that I've told the rest. So let's configure the other server without too many explanations because we explained everything now. It's the same and we'll go to the authoritative. When, when, whenever you want. I configure one zone, right? So let's, let's make some more questions. We'll configure the other recursive. Then we configure the SOA, the occult authoritative. We test that everything is right. And then we configure the two public authoritative. It's three lines in each because, and everything is going. And after that, we, you can play as much as you want. After you configure the SOA, I have to run a script that will enter the SOA that you entered in the parent server, the S record. And when I run that diabolic script, I may lose the labs. Fortunately, it's the end. That is one of the things where the DNSSEC uses a lot of variants and it's uh, controversial because I don't know whether it's fully unified. That is the way that you transfer and you maintain the DNS records of the parents. I have to give it to the administrator of the zone, that is each pair, each parent. Yes, there are things like that, but they are not openly supported because there is a matter of relations between the parties that is not fully solved. Well, there are some members of the community that it's part of their daily practice. Those who work in CCTLDs or TLDs. Yes, Hugo Salgado, if you are there, please raise your hand and to make comments, we'll give you the floor. I don't know whether Hugo is there. No, 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 it's not there. Edmundo, I'm sure that Edmundo has something to say. In the end, well, yes. There are several ways to implement that. And each operator, each in, uh, person that in towards a domain does it. Nico, uh, Matias is asking, he says that the client didn't work. Matias, did you use the client's key? It's group 20, he says. The, there are two uh, key files. One is the password clients and the other password servers. You have to enter the one that says password clients. And you're going to find one that says ERP20, comma, space, and the key. Uh, that's and, and, and the password. That's what you, you have to copy. Times, clients, it's in the line of the GRP20. Let me try it here. I'll do that quickly. Okay, I come here. Here you have the client uh, or group 20. I copy this line that is the URL of the client that corresponds to group 20. I'm going to paste it here. Okay. It's asking for the password. So now I'll go to the password clients, GRP20, and I'll copy the password. I'm going to paste it there and see if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll look for a reason there. I pasted the, uh, the key. Well, you don't need to change that route, but it's just for you to see how it works. And now I'm going to leave. So it's a copy paste problem. So open it with the note uh, block. Yes, indeed, with a notepad. Yes. So there you have the client. Perfect. There. 
All right. So should we go on? Let me ask a tricky question. Uh, who is still in the bathroom? It's very difficult for that person to answer. What does that 127 mean? Well, it's the address assigned to one of the servers that you are consulting. 27 is your group. It's a response to something that is being asked. This must be someone there in the group and it's group 17, sorry, not 27, but 17 and 127. It's an IP address of one of the devices. It might be the client. Oh, the, um, mind, no, the SOA, the recursive server, as we saw here, the recursive server has the address 100, 100, X, that is the group number assigned. If you are 17, it would be 100, 117, and 67. That's the IP address of one. Uh, if you don't put that, it may respond because maybe you are hitting one of the IP addresses of a server that we haven't configured yet. We only configured the one that finishes in uh, 27. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to send a query for the IP address associated to a domain name that has an incorrect signature. So my server that validates DNSSEC is not going to validate it and should reject it. So I'm going to visit the domain. I don't remember the name now. DNS slash uh, hyphen fade dot org. No, it's not this one. Yes, it, no, it's not. Give me a second. Do you remember, Carlos? NSSEC failed. Yes, no, it's NSSEC. It's DNSSEC dot failed. Let me see what it is. Yes, the two of them are there. Good, the two. DNSSEC, hyphen sec.org and a dot failed, they do the same. So let's show the screen so that everybody can see it. So I send a query there for the IP4 address associated to this. It's a domain that on purpose has an invalid signature or some validation problem. So as it has a validation problem and the recursive server could not validate it, it, it this is the error, so fade here, this is the error that appears when there's a domain with the DNS second, it has an invalid signature or there's an er error in the validation. How can I check that? Well, if I put the option CD flag, the city flag option, what it will do is to tell the Bing, uh, my resolver, that although it's validating DNSSEC, that for this consultation to return what he obtains. And if you look at this here precisely, if I ask the same question, but I say do not validate DNSSEC, I get the answer. This confirms that it's a, it's a problem in the validation of DNSSEC. So I a query again, trying to validate DNSSEC, and again, it won't. So there, there's a validation problem. So with this, we, val we confirm that our resolver, a recursive uh, server, is if they find a validation problem, they won't answer it. 
it will return an answer. So we can also send other queries to other sites. For instance, let's ask, for instance, for the associated to DNSSEC of the domain lacnic.net. It, may, it could have been uh, possible. Well, here, I, I, I ask LACNIC to give me the information corresponding to DNSSEC, and in particular this here, the RRSIG, everything, all of this, that is the RR SIG registry. This is the signature, the digital signature that was stored. This registry. It's the IP address associated with the name and the signature. Remember that I needed to have the data that is the IP address associated to the name and then the signature and also I must have the signature and the public key. And that uh, here I can ask for the registry and the signature. With all this information, my recursive server verifies, a valid, validates a signature. There's a question by Maximiliano. He says, so whether there is, uh, have, do you have any experience with the DS record uh, in cases uh, in uh, the domain in Argentina? Take that question to the chat. Maximiliano. Has anybody had any experience with the DS record in the domains in Argentina, the dot Rs? Matias said he could solve the problem. And uh, so that would be it. Um, Matias said that it was a problem of the uh, chair and the keyboard. I have so many windows open that I couldn't see the messages. So let's go to configure the other resolver. De configuración. Acá tenemos otro servidor recursivo que para hacerlo más, más interesante y más parecido. Aquí tenemos otro recursivo recursivo, y esto parecería ser una situación real, donde podemos tener más de un recursivo recursivo, y uno, y cada uno tiene diferentes tipos de software. Porque si tuviera que hacer un upgrade o algo, tengo el otro recursivo recursivo, y es un recursivo recursivo, y es un recursivo recursivo, y es un recursivo recursivo. The problems are not replicated, so each one has its own problems, except from general problems for all that might also occur. So here we have in our resolve two, I'm connected here. Remember, I had connect, I had logged in. So I here put unbound. It's a DNS server that was exclusively designed to be a recursive server. And it has its own features and advantages and also some additional tools that we go describe now, but sometimes make this more interesting than other types of servers for as a recursive server. This is an election made by several uh, people. So we're not going to make any recommendation here. Each one has its own specificities. Some of us have our own <laughs> madnesses. Okay. All right, so here it's installed in the ETC. There we have the unbound. This is the slash unbound. The content of the directory is this here. These are the configuration files for unbound, particularly the .conf and all the other 
unbound configuration files are in this directory. This directory here by default doesn't have anything. So the only configuration file with unbound is this one here, the first one. I have tried the two and I have no preference uh, for any. Now, regarding configuration, you will note that unbound depends on each person. I find it easier to configure unbound that bind. And I must admit that I didn't know anything about Unbound at all. I started researching how this happens, but I ended up learning it. So to keep finger Unbound, we're going to put the configuration file, unbound.conf, just with the include here. And we can follow the manual. We did this already. We changed the unbound directory. We edited unbound.conf. I'm going to add, we're going to add in the configuration file of unbound. Remember that we only have this here. And we're going to include this part here. Let's explain this rapidly. Server. The server option, you have to include this in this and here you have to include all the instructions that will give the unbound. This allows the server to listen to any part of the network using IPv4 and here in a network interface with IPv6. And because it only us has only one network interface, then I could put here network interface to listen to all. And these files here are the same access controls that we used for bind, and we need to configure these for unbound. We don't want the unbound to be an open server. It could also be queried by our client, who's going to be our clients, all the IP addresses of the local host, obviously, all the IPv4 addresses of the laboratory platform, and all the IPv6 addresses of the laboratory's platform for those of us who are more of the operation centers. This looks more like an access list than the bind one. So these are going to be the access controls. This is going to be a port, port to listen. By default, it's going to be listening in the port 53. If you change the DNS port, you'll have to change this value here. And this here, is how I wish this recursive server to function. Of course, I wanted to do UDP queries, TCP queries, IPv4 and IPv6. So all this here should be what we should all have in our homes. So let me copy this configuration. I'm going to go here. I'm going to cross fingers so that this works fine. Oh no, it already did. So while you do that paste, which is going to be more complicated than what you expected, I'm going to answer a couple of questions. Dario Fernandez says, what you have to take into account is that more and more CDNs are being used to provide answers so that the server and the country can deliver the content depending on the origin IP of the query EDNS0. I think that by default, Unbound doesn't enable it. And what Dario says is quite true. And this is a topic in itself. And there are multiple aspects to this. We all want to watch Netflix in 4K, so that is why we watch videos in 4K. And for this, they have to be provided by a site near to us, and very few t uh, sites read this zero. So this is a, a topic in itself. Now, regarding the DNS, EDNS, we have to go to the bind option to see if this is enabled by default. Ariel Weicher, instead of unbound for allow, you can use allow snoop in the access control in order to do a better debugging with JIG. 
O sea, he, he usado muchísimo, más vale. I have used unbound more than bind. Él es un disruptor. Lo que pasa es que yo creo que en todos estos laboratorios siempre hacemos cosas. Que... In all these labs, we always do things that are not very close to reality. Maybe a, a root zone that is not real. And we wanted to set up for this laboratory a topology that should be quite real. We even have hidden authoritative servers. And I think that, and others. Things. I think it's quite good to see what would be a real life scenario and maybe more advanced because there are many organizations that decide not to maintain an uh, occult server and they'll work on the public servers. So this is just to make things more interesting. If you place, place these commands one by one, you won't have any problems. Here we save the configuration and we use the configuration check, but instead of using, we use the unbound check conf, which is to check the semantics and the files. This does return a message when there are no errors. We get the no error message back which is one of the things I also like about Unbound. And like we have here, if there are no errors, we restart the Unbound. The service is called Unbound. We restart and we check the status that we now have. And green, I just love this when it has green running and here we have some notices but nothing that is cause for concern no warning nothing in red that is just beautiful so our server should be working let's see an uh, ip address we do a query here the address of the unbound server is 100 101 because i'm group one dot 68 instead of 67 this is 68 so i go to client and I do the same query. I'm going to ask the DNSSEC for LACNIC, but for 68 to see if this is working. And perfect. There it is, ready. No, over, okay. to you, over to you, Carlos, over to you. So we already configured a bind recursive server and a unbound recursive server, bind and unbound recursive servers. So, for... so this was it. Would you continue, Carlos? How do we go on? Well, I now have to configure an authoritative room. So the ball is in your court, Carlos. Thank you. So now you have to look at the Q&A from the chat. Let me know if any questions come up and all the insults and everything that come up through those communications channels. <laughs> In the event of any emergency, please let me know. So let me share my screen. Ahí se ve, ese soy yo. So that's my screen. And let me make a comment. La gente de traducción porque nos I estamos must, I recognize the people, the interpreters. We're speaking so fast, and this is technical language. And I was wondering how this was turning out. We're really speaking very fast with technical language. So I'd like to <laughs> greet the interpreters and thank them for their work. Thank you, Nico. So. Nico configured a recursive server. I'm going to go one step backwards and go to the servers. I grew up, work with group number two, with machines called group number two, and I'm going to go to one called SOA. There's a server called SOA. 
And this is a server that has a property of being an occult, a hidden authoritative server. This has to do with having a server that is a real owner of the truth. It's a real authoritative server that is hidden. It doesn't receive internet connections. Those who receive internet connections are two others which are also authoritative but have been configured as slaves. And these are the ones that are going to receive the traffic. Now, the advantage of this is when we generate a couple of keys, that couple of keys will be saved in a machine that is not necessarily connected to internet. But we can have firewall and all the mysteries and the magic of security that you might have in the middle. If anyone were to ask, why don't I include a firewall in front of all the DNSs, and then we could have a six hour chat. So better do not ask that. So what do I have here? I have a server. This is a bind. The SOA is bind. And I'm going to configure a zone. Nico invented something that is really cool. And this is a scheme of names that allows him to do encryption of much of this. So my zone is going to be called my group GRP2 is going to be called like this, lacnic35.telabs.training. This is going to be the name of the zone which I'm going to configure. So what do we have to do to configure a zone? We have to do two things. One is that here I'm going to go back to something that those of you who in Argentina will recall fondly, especially women. There is a channel called Utilissima. They had a, a program on cooking. And I said, how do I show live on television how to bake a cake? Well, first I have the batter and all of a sudden you have a cake that is ready and comes out of the oven. So I'm going to do the same thing here. So my greetings to Utilissima. We really miss that channel, that TV channel. So I have to do two things. One of the two things is to configure the records. The records are record with a zone file. This is a bit long, and between copying and pasting it, it's about the same thing. You have it in, in your guide. You can do copy paste if you wish. And the zone file is going to come up here. It's going to, what do I have in the zone file? This is quite a typical one. It has an SOA file to NS files, to A files, to quad A files for the NSs. And then it has another type of records that are there just as an example. For everyone, it's important Si ustedes se fijan, ahí está este, el, el, un, un, una zona tipo, digamos, donde ustedes tienen que cambiar las X por el número de grupos. Si ustedes agarran eso, lo copian, lo pegan y cambian las X por el número de grupo, van a obtener exactamente lo que Carlos este, ya, tiene, ya tiene, tiene pegado ahí, lo que les está contando. Simplemente para Exacto. facilitarles la tarea, digamos. Porque sí, si no, exactamente. Van a enloquecer. Eh, yo que me quería detener un, en un par de cosas que son importantes de un archivo de zona, que son, por ejemplo, esta macro que está acá arriba, esto que dice pesos TTL. ¿Se acuerdan que yo hablé del tiempo de vida? Eh, lo que es el, el tiempo de calle de un registro que tiene que ver con el, eh, cuánto se almacena en, tiempo en, un, en un servidor intermedio. Y acá lo que ustedes tienen es... Eh, yo ahí le, le definí 30 segundos. 30 segundos es un tiempo de TTL extremadamente corto en Internet. <risa> Pero para efectos prácticos en un laboratorio, si le ponemos tiempo muy largo, nos vamos a aburrir esperando que las cosas cambien. Entonces, por eso le pusimos un tiempo muy corto. Paul Vix eh, está, Paul Paul está Paul, por, Paul por golpearte decir, con su monitor, si exactamente. pudiera, por, por sugerir que pongan 30 segundos en el TTL. Acá en el registro SOA tienen algunas cosas curiosas. Primero, acá lo primero que tienen es el nombre de la zona, efectivamente. Y después tienen una cosa que es bastante sui generis, que es eh, esto que viene acá, prácticamente nadie lo usa. Este, de hecho es una buena pregunta de Cajut, ¿qué es esto que viene acá después del nombre del dominio? 
El, es un mail. Supuestamente es el correo electrónico del de, eh, administrador de la zona, pero en vez de una arroba lleva un punto, porque la arroba es un carácter que tiene significado en los archivos de zona. Entonces esto sería root.example.com. La verdad que mi imaginación ayer de noche estaba un poco eh, turbada y no, 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 no pude salir del example.com. Eh, eh, pero bueno, lo que viene ahí curiosamente es un mail. Eh, Podría ser dnsadmin.grp2. Sí, exactamente, hostmaster o webmaster, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, el, hace años, hace como cuatro o cinco años, me escribió una persona a decirme que en una de las zonas reversas de la NIC teníamos eso mal. Eh, y tenía razón, era un mail que no existía más. Eh, la verdad que nos agarró completamente por sorpresa. Vaya un saludo para ese amigo que es de Ripe. Este, Bien, el número de serie, este es importante, es muy importante. El número de serie tiene que ver con las distintas revisiones de la zona y es lo que los esclavos se van a fijar para transferirse a la zona. Los esclavos o secundarios se van a fijar en el número de serie y si ven que comparado con su copia el número de serie cambió, se lo van a copiar. Si se incrementó, se lo van a copiar. Eh, después viene una serie de timers Este que dice acá eh, El caché negativo ¿Se acuerdan cuando les hablé de que los NX domain se callean? Bueno, este es, el, este es el TTL de los NX domain Ustedes se preguntarán por qué, lo, ¿Por qué se especifica acá y no se especifica en el propio TTL? Porque en los NX domain no hay registros Es decir, no hay registros donde, No hay un registro en X domain donde mandar esa información Entonces lo tengo que dar por otro vía Y esto abre una puerta a todo otro tema que es cómo firmo los NX Domain, este, y ahí este, espero, que, espero que nos quedemos sin tiempo antes de entrar en ese tema, porque es bastante cabroso. Mentira, después lo comentamos un poquito. Este, ahí yo la pudrí este, también, el, el, NX, el NSX3. Exacto, el NSX3. <risa> y la, este, bien, eh, este tiempo, que es 86.400, vamos a tomar la oportunidad esta, la vamos a cambiar, la vamos a poner 30 también, ya que estamos, este, no me voy a preocupar demasiado por la alineación eh, en este momento. Estos dos que vienen son los registros NS. Estos son los registros NS, o sea, los, los servidores de nombres de esta zona. Y acá viene un, todo un tema, que es el siguiente. Ustedes, quizás, bueno, los que ya saben de NS ya, ya saben ¿no? por dónde viene esto. Quienes ven estas cosas por primera vez deberían estar preguntando cómo puede ser que los registros NS sean nombres que están en la misma zona. ¿Cómo se el entera problema, el mundo? El problema de huevo y la gallina, digamos. El problema de huevo y la gallina, exactamente. Eh, y sobre todo, ¿cómo puede ser que después, cuando yo tengo que hacer la segunda consulta para resolver esos nombres a direcciones, que tengo que venir a estos registros A y 4A que están acá, ¿de dónde los saca el mundo? ¿Cómo el mundo se entera que eso existe si en realidad acá hay un tema de hay un huevo y hay una gallina? Bueno, la respuesta a eso es que estos mismos registros existen en la zona padre. Los mismos, así como están acá, existen en la zona padre. Y son los únicos tipos de registros que se llaman registros fuera de zona que se permiten en una zona de NS, de, en una zona de NS y estos registros de acá, estos cuatro, cuando están en la zona padre, tienen un nombre particular que son los Blue Records, los registros pegamento. ¿Por qué? Porque son los que mantienen pegada la Internet. ¿Por qué? Porque justamente hacen ese nexo, hacen eso de huevo y la gallina. O sea, básicamente legislan quién fue huevo y quién fue gallina en esto. Carlos, en, el, en, el, sí. en, el, en, la, en la letra del, del, del laboratorio también, eh, nosotros pusimos ahí bajo el título ¿Qué es lo que ya sabemos? ¿Sí? Y dice, nuestro padre, ya, o sea, la zona padre, ya ha creado lo siguiente en su propia zona, y ahí este, Carlos puso exactamente copy-paste copy de, de la configuración para un grupo X que hay en la zona padre. Y ahí, si se fijan, tienen los dos registros NS, exactamente estos dos registros NS, y tienen los glue records, o sea, los registros A, y los registros cuádruple A correspondientes a ese mismo, este, a ese mismo, eh, a esos mismos servidores de nombre, a esos mismos NS. Era eso, Cam. Perfecto, buenísimo. Y acá, después lo que viene son unos registros cualquiera, es un A para el triple W, este, un FTP, este, que es solo por IPv6, eh, tres registros que se llaman nombres y tienen tres nombres. Eh, es para ver el caso de la que tenemos más de un valor para el mismo nombre, y ya que estamos, vamos a agregar uno que sea un CINAME. Bueno, nos faltó un CINAME. Vamos a poner FTP2 CINAME. ¿Vos, ¿Vos querés romper todo a propósito? Todo, todo, todo. Vamos a romper todo. El FTP, vamos a ver que tenemos un FTP2 que lo manda el mismo que el FTP. 
Muy bien, acá, cuando uno hace esto y hace cambio, fíjense que nosotros hicimos dos cambios en la derecha de zona, lo que corresponde es incrementar el serial, que viene después del 1, el 2. Ustedes saben de que en realidad en los números de serie hay una convención, es pues una convención, digamos, que, que uno puede respetar o no, que tiene que ver con... Eh, tiene que, básicamente tiene que ver con el hecho de eh, usar la fecha en formato año, 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 mes, mes, día, día, este, como número de serie y irlo incrementando a medida que uno lo va modificando. Eso es, es, es práctico, es útil, está interesante. Este, lo pueden usar o no, como guste. En general se usa. Bueno, ese es el primer paso. ¿Me alcanza con esto? No, no me alcanza. Pero yo les quiero mostrar una cosa, este, que sobre todo que esto, quienes operan binds o servidores de DNS en, en ambientes de producción y tocan zonas, zonas importantes, eh, si, no lo, si no lo conocen ya, les recomiendo lo empiecen a usar, que es el comando check zone. Ahí está. El comando así check zone. Como, ah, así como estaba el name el check conf para checar las configuraciones, está el comando claro, name sí, el sí, check zone. Exactamente. Ahora voy, después voy a mostrar el check conf, pero esto, como todavía no tengo que ir a la configuración, no, no me va a decir nada, o no debería decirme nada. Este, el check zone lo que hace es: yo le voy a pasar un nombre de zona y le voy a pasar el archivo donde está definida esa zona, que yo le llamé db.grp2. Y acá lo que vamos a hacer, o sea, que lo que el checksum va a hacer, va a leer el archivo de zona, y basado en la etiqueta de zona que yo le pasé, me va a decir si es una zona válida o no. Y si tengo errores, me lo va a marcar. Esto es súper útil. Y no tengo errores. Fíjense lo que me dijo. Me dijo que la zona tal se pudo cargar, ese es un loaded, es como, la, es como, el, es como el dedito para arriba del bind, y me dice que el serial es 2. ¿Se acuerda que el serial le pusimos 2? Y me dijo, ok. O sea que la zona está bien. Ahora, la zona todavía no está cargada. Para lo cual tengo que hacer otro cambio, que es el siguiente. Tengo que venir a la configuración del bind y decirle que efectivamente hay una zona nueva. Y eso lo vamos a hacer también en el namedy.conf.local que les mostraba Nico. Y vamos a poner lo siguiente. Vamos a poner zone, grp2, la clic. 35t-labs.training Vamos a abrir un corchete Type Master Cuando le digo Type Master es eh, porque este es un eh, primario o un maestro es el que tiene el archivo de zona mismo Justamente claro, por eso le tengo que decir File sí, dale. Un comentario rápido sobre eso eh, <coughs> que no es técnico pero es relevante eh, hay, 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 hay muchísimas razones, pero, pero hay unas razones bien claras y, y principales que motiva, motivan este, que a veces determinados usos del lenguaje que tenemos sean modificados. ¿sí? Por ejemplo, el uso de master y slave, que, te, que a nivel técnico se utilizó desde, desde los comienzos de, 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 de las redes, digamos, este, eh, se, se, ha, se ha ido cambiando por suerte y, 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 en, y, en, y, en, y en el mejor de los sentidos, se ha ido cambiando por terminología más, este, más, más, más inclusiva y, más, y menos, este, menos potencialmente hiriente. ¿sí? Entonces, eh, por ejemplo, ya no, ya no se suele decir master, se, se suele decir pre primary, primario, y no se suele decir slave, se dice secundario. Entonces, hablamos de servidores primarios esta, y secundarios. ¿Esta versión lo tiene? ¿Te y, exacto, y hay, tiene? no me acuerdo si esto lo tiene, pero no, no lo pruebe, ah, no lo pruebe ahora porque este, es no, reporte de riesgo. No, lo que quería decir es que las últimas versiones las han incluido casi todos los, 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 los servidores, los tipos de servidores, Bind, Outbound, NSD, bueno, casi todos han incluido ya ese cambio de, de terminología, por supuesto que mantienen por, por compatibilidad hacia atrás, este, para no romper todo lo que ya están dando, la terminología anterior, pero este, tengan, tengan en, consider en consideración que este, ahí, eh, es mejor utilizar que soportan, primario y secundario. Dice... Ahí va, donde dice master, ustedes pueden poner type primary y debería claro, ser lo sí, mismo. Y para los, de, para los secundarios de zona, en vez de poner slave, como se ponía eh, antes, se pone secondary y, y eso debería funcionar. Y un comentario para, bueno. para los que van a. Grabo el archivo con WQ y ahora les voy a mostrar el check conf, que es el equivalente del check zone, pero para la configuración. Ahí dice cualquier cosa. Eh, check. Conf. El check conf solamente le tengo que decir cuál es el archivo que quiero chequear. Él va a seguir solo los includes y los va a ir incluyendo y los va a validar. Este es medio parco, su salida es un poco parca y si, y si no da errores, este, simplemente no dice nada. 
Este, no, tiene palabras de elogio, Respire, no, tiene, no tiene palabras de elogio para nosotros decirle, muy bien, Carlos, muy bien. No. Acabo de respirar. Si hay errores, este, es bastante expresivo. ¿Esto por qué está bueno? Se dan cuenta solo. Este, ninguna de estas dos acciones reinició el servidor. Why is this good? None of these restarted the server. Si yo tengo errores, tanto en el archivo de zona, If I have errors in the zone file, I just correct my errors, and when the zone and the configuration are okay, then I go forward. So this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to restart the server. And now I will check the status. Carlos prefers to use the named. Well, for those of you who were proposing in Discord to do the test match with system D and IP, well, here you have an example of that clash between brothers. Whenever we have a Linux terminals, well, for those of you who ask yourselves, yes, you can use any of the two. My problem is NTC and it has a complete, and it completes it automatically. So I have to remember what the name of the service is, or the unique, or the system D, and I'm no longer there for that kind of thing. That is why I use it with ID. But many of the services no longer have the init D, because the any so. Well, I love the, how this helps you. And maybe some purists might tell me there's some way of putting the autocomplete of bash so that this can help you. But once again, like I fell off the world, I really don't know how to do that. So these are good news. The zone has been loaded with serial two, which is the one we included here. All zones loaded. So when you restart the server, the server is going to restart anyway if there's an error. So the, if the configuration has errors, this won't start successively. But if there's a zone with errors, the server will load whatever it can. And that will show me which were the rejected errors, for example. Yes, this may be as complex as you may wish. You might have a server and not just have one zone like this one, but you might have 10 zones, and those who divide the administration, so you have different people who administer different zones. So maybe I configured a zone badly, so that won't be loaded and that won't work, but the rest will continue to work. So that's one of the reasons why that behavior is reasonable, like Carlos was saying. Yes, the server has to pick up, and all the zones that are fine have to pick up. If there is a mistake, well, they won't load this. So that is left outside until it is corrected. Well, while Nico was commenting on that, I did a bind and you know, to put clear so that you can see what I really did. I did a bind, I asked for this, a GRP2 and so on. We're running out of time, so let us go to the final goal. And many things happened here that I would like to comment on. I did a query and look at what it returned. In fact, this is what I had configured. There's a 30 here. Remember that the 30 that I had configured was a TTL. So if I do this dig once again, I have a 30, this find, sorry. You ask yourself, why is there a 30 there? I did this stick and I have this here. It always is the same when it is an authoritative server, whether primary or secondary, the two are authoritative. When we do this test with your recursive one, you will see that that time drops. And that's most interesting because you see then when a reply is authoritative or not. So what happens here? If I would like if, if I were an application, I would like to use this host. In fact, I asked with a name and it returns something else. So what you have to do, you might forget this. I can ask the A. 
Pero por defecto, cuando no pongo And that's the, by def the query by default. So let's see if this works. If I can copy and paste. Yes, it did work. Okay. And this did not work. And I realized why, because this was not the right one. It was a quad A. You forgot to configure NAT64. Well, for next time. And now you have this address here. Now, normally, when you when you are writing an app, there is something called GitHub find name, and it ends up being this query with an address register record. I asked for A, and remember that for this one, there is no A. He corrects himself, quad A. Now, the server is not stupid, and the DNS server tries to give us a hand. And that help is done in the form of, well, I know you want to have an address, so I'm going to give it to you. And this is returned to me, do you realize? So even when, if we are strict, the resolution as name, is two queries, this ends up being a simple query, the C name. So, there we have the zone. Would you like to make the query copy and paste it at the client? No, I haven't opened it and I don't have the key. But yes, well, give me a second, give me a second. I don't know how I have configured that client. The client has been already configured. That I, I don't have to put allow query, no. GRP1 hyphen. ¿Cuál sería la IP del cliente? Del cliente del grupo 2. A ver. No, so el grupo. Client of group 2. Well, I'm group 2, I remember. I'm doing, I'm using 2. Uh, so it won't work. It won't work. Just leave it like that. It's okay. It's the same. The recursive for group two have been done. So you can use it. But if I do this now, you know, it's going to close. We can do it at the end. So now let us generate the keys. And I have already generated these. And let me show you the command as to show you how I did this. The key files, you can put them wherever you wish, but it's good to have a certain order and you generate key pairs. As they expire, you have to create new ones and they start accumulating. So it's important to be tidy. Carlos, you can delete them and start once again, if you wish. Okay, that's good. We have to wrap up anyway. Yes, we have to wrap up. If everything breaks down, we just leave. Okay. You're going to do a violent rollover. I deleted the files and the command to generate this. is like you can imagine something called key gen. This command here is the one that I'm going to use to generate a pair of keys. You have always two, a pair of keys, public and private. It has the KSK on. Remember the KS keys? These are going to, used, going to be used to sign the zone I'm going to put the DNS in the parent and as to have the flag on when you do being this flag values, the value is 257. So we click to enter and magically 
you have two files here. One is dot key. And let's see. The dot key has a DNS key, which is totally valid. And you could space it on a zone key, but it wouldn't do anything on its own because the presence of the key in the zone doesn't make it automatically signed. And we have colons and commas. This has signing key. You all have the key indicator, and you all have to see which zone they correspond to. And then you have metadata, which are dates. The metadata set created, publish, and activate. They all have the same value. But in fact, and this is a key rotation thing, this was created to, be, to start to use it now and does not expire. It never expires. But that's not good. Keys naturally should expire. There are the three parameters, which are the counterparts of these, like the end of life for the keys. But one is called inactivate. And it shows you when they are no longer published and when the key becomes invalidated. So that is the lifetime of the key. It was born today and it dies on X date. The other two timers have to do with the following. I can create the key, but it couldn't be used immediately to sign. Remember the roles and all those things that we spoke about earlier on, because that when I sign the entire zone, the zone starts to expand and expand because I add RR SIG and so on. I can publish a key that is a key that will always be used, but I'm not using it yet. So that gives me time so that all the servers in this zone cache this key and somehow know that there will be a new key and have it there in case all of a sudden signatures come up. So let me show you this here. This here is a file format separated by colon, not by commas. And this has to do with the private part of the key here. There are certain parameters that have to do with the algorithm. This depends on the algorithm. You will note that it has a identification of the format. This is identification of the algorithm RSA, H, SHA256. So we're using this key, RSA, and we're using caches. The cache hash is 256. And then the mathematical parameters. This here, guess what? This is not published in the DNS. It is not published. It's private. If it is published and if it's stolen, I really have to do an emergency action. It's as if you would be robbing my key of my credit card. So then we have to sign the DNS tech keys. There's no flag for the ZSK. And here, once again, magic. And I'm going to show you something that can be tricky with some of the Linux versions, particularly the older ones. I'm going to show you the public one. The private one is not so interesting. And it's 01953. And here you see I have the same thing. And a DNS key, but with the flag 256. So I'm ready to sign the zone. Carlos, one thing. The two are of 2048 bits. 
and you could turn this a bit smaller. The flag that used here, I'm asking it to generate keys of 2048 bits. In general, what you do is to rotate it less frequently, to rotate the KSK less frequently. You place it in the parent, and because a KSK is only signs the DNS keys, so it doesn't enlarge this so much. Now, for the ZSK, it's like using shorter keys. I didn't do it now, and I'd rather not tempt destiny. But ZSK is shorter. It is a smaller key. Not only the key is smaller, but the signatures are also smaller. So in that way, the entire zone is smaller. Just a comment. When the ZSK is smaller, one of the advantages is, because in addition what Carlos says, when you transfer a recursive, it's going to do the query, and the authoritative will send all the information, the electronic signature, the public key for verification. If that is signed by a big key, this occupies more space. You have to transfer more information. So it's more likely that the DNSSEC studies using TST and and also generating more traffic, and it's a greater load for validation for the recursives. The complex, the more complex the key, then the encryption involves more time resources. So, in addition to the uh, record, the ZSK, which is the one that signs all the records is normally smaller because it's one that is most used. The other one is just used to sign the CNSK. So ready to sign, Nico? There was a TV program called Changing Rooms in the BBC, and it was great. And at the end, after reforming the house, they discovered this because they open the curtain and you had the moment of truth. So here, this is the, the DS set should delete that or generate a new one. It's going to generate it, but I've had experiences that when you don't do this, it has an issue when you don't delete the previous ones. So our time is almost up. We're going to call the magician to make us disappear. So we're going to take the zone file that we had from before. We're going to include the two key pairs that we generated. I'm going to generate a signed zone. I'm going to use a command that I used before, which is the sign, sign zone. So I have a series of flags, and the most important ones is the one here, minus four K keys. And I'm telling it what the name of the zone is, and this is important. And I'm telling it which is the unsigned zone file. ¿Qué pasó? So, let's see what happened. It has a zone, it has the keys, and it generated a new zone file, which should be here now. So here you see I have a dbgrp2.signed. And look at one thing, dbgrp2 was our regular file, 620 bytes, which is a modest size. Now, look at this here, dbgrp2 signed, it's 11k, so it's much bigger, it's 10 times bigger. So that is why we have to have certain precautions when managing the key lengths and not signing multiple times unnecessarily, particularly if you have big zones, 
So that is the important point. And that's one of the things that we have to pay attention to. So what do we have in that file DB sign? Let's have a look. Isn't this so neat? I have the same records that I had already, the SOA, and obviously this file won't touch anything, it won't change anything in the zone conceptually, but it will add things. I have the SOA, and what do I have here? The RR SIG of the SOA, SOA. The NSs, the two are together, but there's only one RR SIG for the NSs because the DNS in the resource record sets, all the records that have the same name and the same type sign, are signed together. And this is quite an interesting concept and quite basic. Let me give you another example. Let's look it up. Here we have names. Look at the three with the names, and they have been signed. Nombres is names. The three records, just one signature. And some of you might be asking yourselves, what is this here, NSEC? And this is where a dis interesting discussion will be opened regarding signing the negative answers. We don't have time to discuss that. Just keep the idea that NSEC is one of the two ways that you have for signing negative answers. What you generate here is a record to have something to sign, and then the signature is re re generated, RRSIG. And finally, what we have right at the end, Here we have the signatures of the DNS keys. You see here that we have two signatures compared to the others. This is because they have been signed with the two keys. The DNS key is signed with the ZS key and with the KSK. So here, we just have one thing left. You have to restart it. I first have to change this here, this part of the configuration. I have to go here, and I'm no longer going to use a dbgrp2. So I'm going to use this one. I did a dig and go save it so that you can see it's not validating yet. And I'm going to do the same, di the same dig and add here DNSSEC. And what do we have there? Remember that FPT2 was a C name. And when I ask for the quad A, but in fact, it's a C name, the server is cool and the friend, and it returns the other record too. So what do I have here? You can see I have the C name. It tells us that FTP2 is a C name, and this record, record has its signature. And then in quad A is one, two, and this has its also a signature. So I have all the signatures that I require to validate this on itself. But in fact, here we have the chain of trust thing, so I have to go up to enable the chain of trust until I reach the key. Nico, how do we continue? Did you restart the server? Yes, I did. Yes, and it returned the response. I still have to generate the DNS. Why don't you copy and paste? I saw you had put the command. It's the one over here. And DS is a record that is not exact. It's a hash of the DNS. So it is generated with a command, and there are different ways to do so. And what Nico does here, it is possible. You can do a dig with a DNS key, 
and see if I can join with the genus key and let's see and there it is so this generated the file and now I have to redirect it it's DSZ so you have to have a file DS record etc can you repeat it's bind did you put it in the zoom in the chat of the zoom just spell it out it's slash slash DNS slash DNSSEC slash keys slash DS record. Replace that because it already exists. The T will be in charge of that. It's a wonderful command. Those who don't know it, I recommend the command T E. T. So let's do a cut. To check. Maybe you can share your screen now. Well, this is a script that is has to run. But let me check one thing first. Because now what we have un archivo de ese, un de ese que está puesto ahí. is a DS, a file, a DS, which is not valid because we changed it. So I wanted to see if we could show some kind of query in the dig that shows a validation error. No seche. Well, I wouldn't know really. So let me run the script. So let's check. I don't know if you opened the NS1, which has already configured. It's just three lines for the secondary one. NS1, I haven't opened it, but I can go there. It's going to run the 50 groups. And it's going to take some time. I don't know who is group 10, but group 10, I already. I see that uh, it's correct, and they're going to enter it uh, into the second. Ready. Perfect. It should be ready in a minute. The server has restarted. So now we have to wait to see if, if there's any cache hit. If not, it would work. So that's what do you call it? The file that you have to edit is uh, the TC bind uh, locker. Yes, I think that I had done it. It's in the uh, that uh, woman's program that I mentioned, Utilissima. There, it's described. There, it was already there. It would be very interesting to see whether it transferred it. That would be a good thing. 
Let's put dig. If you want to do it directly, you can restart this bind server and see the status. And there you would see the uh, transfer. To force for it to bring it. Maybe it should be better if you restart it, if you reboot it. Yes, to, to force a transfer, to force the checking as the number of zones was increased. Did you increase the number of zones? Uh, ah, no, I didn't. Sure. I should have incremented it. This is not the first time that this happens. It happens to me every time. That explains why I did a dig and it went on. And I said, but if I change, if the chain of trust was broken, this shouldn't happen. As I didn't see that the number of zones changed, let me see whether you notice what happened. What happened? I did the zone file and we had put serial two. When I signed it, I didn't change the serial. What I should have done was to increase the serial because in the end, those that transfer look at the serial, not the other. That is why here I dumped, uh, it, it didn't bring uh, the RCC uh, re registries. So that surprised me. I didn't find any explanation. So what do we have to do? We have to increase the number of zones, says Nicolaus. Yes, we increase the number of zones. So we reaffirm this. We sign uh, and we reboot, restart. Let's see what happened here. Beautiful, now yes. Okay, wonderful. Now I have a serial three and a DNSC registries. Good. Now I'll show you. Did you restart? Would you like to go back to the DNS one? This is DNS one. That's a secondary, the slave. What IP, what's the IP address? 2.130. Okay. Just a second. Perfect. You have to share your screen. Uh, would you show us what you're doing? Good. I'll stop sharing. Yes, I'll give it back to you in a minute. I don't know what I'm sharing. The agenda of the event. I'm sure it's wrong. Give me a second. That's a problem of having too many windows open. It's like selling your soul to the devil. So in the GRP2, in the client uh, machine, so we configure. There you have two resolvers that are configured. The SOA, you we generate. We did everything. Now there's a question that I enter here. The question is whether the file is always connected by the parent. No, you will have to generate it and to pass it to the administrator of your parent zone so that he will enter it in the zone and sign it to generate the chain of trust. So the way you transfer it to the parent, there's several ways you can do it from sending it through an SFTP to put it in a pen drive and to take it physically, personally, to make so that they will make sure that it's you. Or there is even an implementation of that that is not there. It's not standardized yet. There's room for improvement in this issue of uh, uh, how to 
and do this so we can figure so we can figure uh, uh, the two resolvers the soa and the secondary service i he am the client so i do a dns uh, query to 100 100 267 this is resolve one it's one of the recursive uh, uh service of a group two so and i'm going to ask about the domain of group two so that recursive is going to go to the root of the dns first and then the authoritative of training and then the authoritative of class and then of lacnic 35 of lab training and finally to the authoritative that has just been signed by carlos the authoritative of grp2 lacnic 35 t labs training and they would uh, uh, show me the results in the screen and you see beautiful that's incredible that's a, an exciting moment no errors and we obtain the response of what we were querying so we did the query let's see here ds For some reasons, I don't have. Nico, I'm I'm being told that we should wrap up and to go to the networking room because the interpreters need to be able to breathe. Well, I'm I'm going to sh to stop this. Well, so far we went uh, with a tutorial let's leave the platform running until tomorrow so if you want to continue to test uh, I, I think that in the spreadsheet there was room for more people for more people to join the platform and get a group to try there are only 19 groups so there are 30 more groups you can use so you can go on and you can try until tomorrow. I think that it's publicly available in the link that Carlos uh, gave us. Yes, and remember that in the repository, you can distance from a local uh, equipment using the background. Background, you have to install that and uh, run a command that is called background up and if you're patient that should leave some distance so the environment will be very similar to this it's not exactly the same but very similar so with this i would say until tomorrow 11 no tomorrow at 2 uh utc 14 utc where we will have the public policy forum what an exciting moment now we're going to have half an hour in the networking room in the virtual fair, so we'll meet you there. Andrea, thank you, Carlos and Nico. Well, apparently the tutorial was very good because the same people stayed throughout the session, so my compliments. Now, the day is over. As Carlos said, we invite you to go to the networking room in the, that you have on the chat and we wait we'll see you tomorrow where we see the second part of the public policy forum and we'll tell you about some services that are provided by LACNIC we'll let's see again uh, tomorrow at 14 UTC thank you